Pulse and Wipe? No. Okay. I need to know something about Yesterday. Yeah, right. I'll call and ask him. Did you just call me? You know all this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're ready. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to the Sacramento Transportation Authority and the Sacramento Abandoned Vehicle Service Authority for January 9th. Madam Clerk, would you take the roll and subject warrant? Yes. Good afternoon. Supervisor Carr. Frost. Here. Garrett. Gatewood. Here. Gitta. Gitta. Here. Hansen. Here. Harris. Here. Howe. Here. Hume. Here. Kennedy. Here. Sandhu. Here. Miller. Natoli. Here. Chenier. Here. Serna. Here. Suen. Here. Peters. Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Okay. Would everyone rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, would you like to read the statement? Yes. This meeting of the Sacramento Transportation Authority is cable cast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and the AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and webcast at www.metrocable.tv. Today's meeting will replay on Sunday, January 12th at 2 p.m. and again on Monday, January 13th at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. Members of the audience wishing to address the board may sign up using the speaker slips located in the back of the room and hand it to the clerk. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the board and state your name for the record. Okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> Let's uh, go to item one, please. Item number one is comments from the public regarding matters not on the agenda. I have one speaker, Jeffrey Tardigia. <coughs> Chairman Peters, board, I want to remind you of what happened four years ago, because four years ago, here we are looking at a transportation tax. What I also find is, is you got people behind you right now that are wanting to support you in this. What, as I've said to Henry, is simply this is not enough money for the transportation needs. So you need to figure out how do you address transportation needs. And what I will say this time, I guess I'm gonna not only talk the talk, but walk the walk. And that means people getting out there and talking to drivers why they need a public transportation tax. But I note, and you as board members should ask this question, how many on your consultant asked public transportation questions? I've talked with three of your interviewees on there, and they found that the people just laughed when dealing with public transportation. So you need to explain in this time of public education why public transportation needs to be supported. And I don't think you yet at the STA have made that absolutely totally clear. You just seem to be spending measure A money and you've had pilot projects out now for two years that have you even had a report back. This is dealing with the discovery of the $1 million that you had that for eight years was being collected. and principally RT is spending it, but have you had a report back of what were the reasons why you didn't get, you know, had to change vendors and this year now going to a new VIA as the vending service for the new services? I've already discovered several problems with that, which I will talk with Henry when Henry wants to talk with me. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any other off-agenda speakers, but I do want to take this moment to, um, I'm sure, Many, if not all of you, were here at the last meeting where we didn't have enough time for public speaking, and I promised you you'd be first on the agenda. And so we are going to have a do the consent, and then we'll go to the 30-plus people who signed up 
um, last month to speak, and then we'll add the additional speakers who came in today that weren't here the month before, just so you know what we're up to here. So, um, Madam Clerk. The next item is your executive director's report. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, this is uh, my first uh, full meeting. I don't have Norm to lean on anymore, so um, I uh, hope everything goes well. To uh, the point just made by the chair, uh, you have a, a written report uh, of uh, items that uh, I wanted to uh, bring to your attention. Uh, so I'll just skim through these very quickly so that we can get to the uh, input uh, uh, in short order. Um, uh, we have seen some bond capital program savings uh, by virtue of renegotiating, and thanks very much to our staff. Uh, we're able to uh, uh, gain savings uh, by uh, some fee reductions. Uh, Will, of a uh, just since it's your first meeting and you wouldn't know this, but you really have to lean forward oh. to that, lean in to that microphone. Lean in. There we go. Now All right. that, then we can hear you okay, better. Is that better? All right. So um, yep. we, we've, uh, thanks to staff, been able to do some renegotiations with uh, uh, some of our uh, uh, bond uh, folks that ha will result in uh, savings of $90,000 a year. Uh, and uh, that starts this month, and the savings will stay in the Measure A Capital Program and used uh, to fund uh, projects. Um, the Independent uh, uh, Taxpayer Oversight Committee uh, met on December 19th. Uh, they uh, approved a calendar for the 2020 year. Uh, and uh, wouldn't you know, the meeting that was scheduled for January 16th is, cancel is uh, canceled because uh, we don't have any a new business for them to take up. We've been working with a bunch, uh, with a number of the other self-help counties in California regarding the uh, SB1 local partnership program. Uh, there were some, there was. Um, much concern about the application deadline. We were successful in getting that moved slightly back, which gives us more time. But we're going to stay on a very active schedule so that we can make sure that uh, Sacramento County is in line for any of those funds. Uh, looking ahead uh, is also a section of the uh, executive director's report. We have a new schedule that we're asking you to approve, which we'll go over in more detail. But essentially, this lays out all of the items uh, through May uh, relative to the uh, adoption of uh, an ordinance and an expenditure plan for a new program um, and uh, the other, uh, some of the other activities that we will be uh, proposing to take uh, over the next several months. Madam Chair, that completes my uh, report. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Any questions for the executive director? Okay. Um. Your next item are your consent items, um, matters three and four before you for approval. Okay, I have a request to speak on item four, so we'll uh, take action three, which is action summary. Yes, ma'am. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 No's or abstentions? Do we have the names on this? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to the screens <coughs> next time. Mr. Kempton, uh, no, I don't want to do it again. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kempton, would you like to sure. have a brief discussion of item four since we have a speaker? Um, there is a uh, requirement in uh, the um, uh, existing Measure A uh, ordinance for a 10-year review of the uh, plan. Uh, incidentally, that uh, requirement is also included in the proposed uh, ordinance that uh, we're, we're uh, putting before you. Um, and uh, we began that effort uh, in November with the presentation of the decennial report, uh, which outlined the accomplishments <coughs> of the uh, original measure uh, or the existing measure over the last 10 years. Um, it seems uh, to staff that, uh, and we've talked with several of the members as well, that for us to go through this 10-year uh, exercise, 10-year review exercise, at the same time that we're putting together a new expenditure plan um, and asking for uh, input uh, from the public with respect to proposed amendments or modifications could be, could be very confusing. Um, and so um, we think there's also an additional opportunity to uh, make the, uh, the ch any changes that might be proposed as part of the 10-year review for the existing measure uh, complementary to the, to the new measure should we <clears throat> decide to go forward and uh, actually have the voters approve that. Um, and we also would miss an opportunity to make the two measures more compatible. And so for those reasons, we're at Excuse me. We're asking that the uh, uh, review uh, be uh, continued, 
until uh, the uh, decision is made as to whether we go forward uh, or until after the measure is approved by the voters, at which time we would uh, renew that effort and uh, complete uh, the review by June uh, 30th of 2021. Okay. Thank you. Jenna Abbott. Well, I'm going to start with an apology. I put down the wrong number. So I'm so sorry. I, I reordered something. It's a total mea culpa on my fault. So what was, item do you want to speak on? Um, I, I'm just here in support of the one of the measures. So I'll okay, just so take probably my seat. item five then. Yes, okay. exactly. All right, thank you. My apologies. We'll move by item four. Uh, yeah, could, uh, could we uh, include item three on that? I think I didn't ask for a motion before. <laughs> yeah, for all consent, three and four. Thank you. So uh, moved. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. Okay, call the next item. Your next item is item number five, is your Measure A Transportation Expenditure Plan Development. Continue from your December 12, 2019, item number six. Number six or five? From, the, from December 12th, it was item number six. Oh, oh, oh December, okay. Um, we have a few people who've uh, signed up in order and uh, I'll call Steve Cohn first. Remind everyone we have two minutes apiece, and I believe that there is a, Metro Cable has a presentation on this? Yes. Well, uh, good afternoon, Chair Peters, uh, members of the board, and a warm welcome to Will Campton, and welcome back, uh, Supervisor Cerna. Uh, Steve Cohn, on behalf of the <coughs> Smart Sac Moves, coalition uh, and thank you for adjusting the schedule to allow greater public input. Um, we support a 40-year measure that incorporates uh, program review every uh, 10 years. We think that's a good move. Uh, of course, we um, believe that we share a common vision that the county should have a seamless transportation network offering a wide range of accessible and affordable choices. Uh, you'll see um, a lot of similarity between the guiding principles that we're proposing and the staff's. Uh, uh, there is one thing uh, about traffic congestion that I want to point out, which is people often confuse congestion relief with building more freeway lanes and interchanges. And studies actually show for every 1% increase in transit funding, you get five times more peak congestion relief for the same amount of money spent on highways. So we should transition to a coordinated multimodal system to remove bottlenecks and move more people with fewer cars. Um, this next slide shows graphically uh, how we propose splitting the pie, uh, basically 50-50 between transit and roads. Now, bear in mind that the existing half cent is weighted more heavily two-thirds towards roads. So uh, if that were to stay, you, you would actually still have 60% towards roads. But we appreciate that there may be a review of that as well. Uh, here is uh, basically a comparison of, of the coalition proposal versus the staff. In a nutshell, the only big difference is taking 8% from uh, highways, putting it towards transit. Uh, that's a detail. Um, and then, of course, we also are proposing that all projects comply with policies. Now, we've set forth some that we believe are based on best practices from other measures, but we welcome the board's uh, ideas on that as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer Finton. Uh, Jennifer Finton. <coughs> Good afternoon, Chair Peters and afternoon. members of the board. I'm Jennifer Finton with Breathe California, Sacramento Region. Uh, I'm, my part today is to stress the importance of SB 743 uh, as it relates to this measure development. So SB 743 was mandated, mandates that the Office of Planning and Research, OPR, develop a transportation impact methodology to replace traditional auto-only level of service analysis 
So the guidelines for this new multimodal VMT-based methodology were adopted by the state in 2018, and as of this year, all land use and transportation projects must now be analyzed through the lens of moving people, not vehicles. Under these new CEQA guidelines, jurisdictions are required to adopt their own thresholds of significance for VMT and their own methods for mitigating these impacts. After much study and analysis, OPR recommends that all transportation projects must demonstrate or mitigate to no net per capita VMT increase. All proposed expenditures, flexible or fixed, should be accompanied by a public VMT impact analysis <clears throat> and periodic review to ensure the cumulative no net VMT standard is being met. Countywide protocols should be developed to identify and deploy VMT mitigating projects. In developing an advanced mitigation program, many examples exist on preservation and habitat enhancement actions that would address various conservation elements in the county, specifically required under CEQA. Some more details on the mitigation requirements for VMT and the advanced mitigation program can be found in the transportation expenditure draft plan that we emailed yesterday. And with that, <clears throat> I'm handing it to Thank you, Ralph Proper. Ralph, thank you. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, going to talk about the growth management policy that we're proposing. Uh, and uh, we have a slide up here on that. Uh, Things have changed a lot over the years. We've come to see uh, how uh, climate change is uh, a very important issue for us to address. Uh, in this room, uh, a few months ago at the Mayor's Climate Commission, uh, we heard uh, PG&E say that uh, in recognition of that, uh, they won't uh, have any more natural gas lines going further out than they currently are. We, uh, we, d we do need a growth management policy. We need to have uh, the uh, growth mainly toward built areas already rather than green fields. Uh, it's, it's hard to justify new roads out, out to green fields when we have a great need for fixing the roads here and having public transit and alternatives to uh, putting out more uh, pollutants uh, into the air for uh, climate change and public health. So uh, we are proposing here that uh, uh, that SDA should not fund projects that would constitute an extension beyond the uh, county's urban service boundary that was approved by the uh, county board uh, back in the 90s. And also that uh, as other uh, jurisdictions around the uh, state have already uh, done, uh, that each jurisdiction in the county should adopt and maintain a growth management plan to show how there will be the encouragement of growth in developed areas rather than uh, green fields. So uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what I have to say on, on the, uh, you know, we, we need to have more uh, support of infill uh, development in existing urban areas and reinvestment and uh, supporting the existing transportation system. Uh, that's where the focus uh, needs, needs to be. Thank you. Thank you. Glenda Marsh. Thank you, Board. I'm Glenn DeMarsh here with Sacramento Metro Advocates for Rail and Transit. So um, th with the next slide, our uh, other key policy that we would like to uh, see adopted. I think you have control of the slides. Oh, sorry. Thank you. There we go. Oops. The other one, the well-worn the well one. Okay. Um, Okay, so we also are advocating for a specific public transit and rail policy, and that is meant to help give guidelines as well as a priority for uh, <coughs> integrating transit uh, into everything that we do because it is such a huge um, player when it comes to reducing congestion and, and moving lots of people around and doing it efficiently and affordably. It has so many benefits. So instead of transit being an, an afterthought, um, it should be thought of first whenever, whenever any street or road is being worked on in, in any part of the community uh, to see how bike, bike, pedestrian, and transit facilities uh, uh, can be integrated. So contrary to uh, what some think, uh, our policy to support transit is not a transit versus roads 
uh, dichotomy. Um, the roads are obviously very important for getting people to transit and also for transit to operate on. What uh, we clearly are advocating for is an integrated system where we are thinking first about how transit helps us move people the most efficiently of, of just about anything you can think of, and how are we gaining the full benefits? You know, we don't want to leave any benefits of this mode on the table. So we are advocating for a, a transit first policy. So we're really thinking about those things. Um, there's our, on this on this slide. There are some elements of the uh, policy points, uh, types of policies that we would like to see uh, discussed and, and considered. Um, so uh, there you have it. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks very much. Sue Taranishi. Good afternoon. My name is Sue Taranishi and a longtime city resident. Have been an active volunteer for many years with, with Breathe California of Sacramento and the Sacramento Area Bicycle Advocates. And so I've been involved in promoting active transportation for a long time. We are uh, recommending that all roadway projects, oh, sorry. Oops. Other way. The other button. The other, there yeah. you go. There you go. Regarding complete streets, that all roadway <laughs> projects should incorporate complete streets principles. In, in the planning, design, construction, operations, maintenance, reconstruction, and rehabilitation. Complete streets are streets that are safe for everyone to use, including pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and transit riders of all ages and abilities. And I think that's really important to remember that we want it safe for our children to use as well as our seniors. I think for too many years, the focus has been on streets and uh, moving cars as easily and quickly as possible. And we've neglected um, the idea that streets really are public space and that we're all paying for them and they should be safe for all users. So we want it safe for motorists certainly, but for pedestrians, for bicyclists, and um, for everyone, as I said, the, the principle of being safe for eight to 80. STA should develop project development guidelines, including peer review, design standards, <coughs> and a complete streets checklist and Thank consider you. contacts for each project. Thank project. you. Thanks. Chris Holm. Thank you. Chris Holm with Walk Sacramento. The road and traffic, the road traffic health and safety policy aims to eliminate roadway fatalities and severe injuries by creating safer streets and to improve health outcomes by reducing air quality emissions and increasing opportunities for physical activity. The Centers for C Disease Control and Prevention reported last year that road traffic crashes are the leading cause of death for people aged 1 to 54 in the U.S. Between 2008 and 2017, pedestrian bicycle fatalities increased by 32%. Sacramento County has also seen increased roadway fatalities with a disproportionate percentage being pedestrians and bicyclists. The road traffic health and safety policy treats individual mobility and access as a fundamental right of the general public to attend school, conduct business, and visit friends and family free from the risk of physical harm due to traffic and poor roads. Implementation of this policy is intended to reduce community, societal, and economic costs due to loss of life and injury, to lessen congestion stemming from traffic collisions, reduce air pollution, and enhance the overall health and quality of life for residents in the Sacramento County. No loss of life due to traffic collisions and crashes is acceptable. Vision Zero is an internationally recognized multidisciplinary approach to eliminating traffic fatalities. The safety of people is placed before the movement of vehicles in transportation planning and engineering decisions. 
The policy will require STA to develop and adopt a Vision Zero policy incorporating best practices for street design elements and programs to mitigate human error and quantifiably improve the traffic safety of all users in the planning and design and construction of STA funded projects. Now please welcome Glenn Jackson Jr. Glenn Jackson Jr. Hi, my name is Glenn Jackson Jr. I have spoken before at the Sacramento Transportation Authority a few times before. Some board members Glenn, may have heard. Glenn, if you could, uh, don't hold the microphone, stand between the two of them, and then we can understand you better. You need to talk into both microphones. In Some board members may have heard of my accident. Some may not. I will. Last year, I was coming home from school. I was in the crosswalk. I had the green light. The lady looked at me and still hit me and my scooter. Ever since that day, I became a serious advocate for safety. I have to commute every day to and from school. I ride my bike 20 minutes, then catch bus 11, then ride my bike the rest of the way to school. This is something I have to do, not something I want to do. There's no public transportation where I live. Any middle school that's closest to me, I have to commute to, as I am either on the streets or in the bike lanes. I have to worry if I'm going to be hit. According to the Wall Street Journal, Sacramento is the fifth deadliest city for bicyclists in the United States. I'd like for Sacramento to be the fifth safest city in the United States. I, I hope the board members adopt a transportation plan that will make safer routes to school that includes serious attention to bike lanes. Now please listen to Mr. Roger Dickinson. Thank you. Good job. Thanks, Glenn. Dickinson. Mm -hmm. you got it. Roger, you might Madam Chair and, and members, Roger Dickinson on behalf of SMART and SAC Moves, thanks very much for the opportunity this afternoon to discuss our policy framework. I hope you will take a thorough look at it as obviously this is a, a narrow version of, of what we're presenting. Um, but I do want to put some emphasis on the, on the taxpayer safeguards and public accountability which we believe are crucial to, to any successful measure. More broadly, the essence of our message to you today is that we cannot go forward using the template of the past. We must assemble a measure which will stand the test of time over the next 40 years, which we know will bring enormous and even unforeseeable technical lifestyle and demographic changes. Our focus must center on how we will successfully move people and goods, not just in our own jurisdictions, not just in our county, but across our region and beyond. To preserve the enviable quality of life we enjoy will require a transportation network that serves a growing economy, a healthy environment, and thriving communities. The framework we have presented is designed to meet those challenges. Its adoption and implementation will increase mobility options, creating true modal choices allow our residents to pursue healthy lifestyles, reduce the frustration of congestion, enable economic expansion and job creation, and position us to meet critical environmental goals. We are interconnected and interdependent. None of us will ultimately succeed unless we all succeed. Therefore, this measure, that you are considering must be built on a foundation that invests first in fixing and maintaining our existing network and making transportation investments in facilities and services which will enhance transportation safety and choices in the future. Thanks very much and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you. Deborah Banks.
Deborah Banks? She's not here. Okay, and I thank you for saying that, whoever did. There may be some people, these are the people who had signed up last month, so there may be some of them that couldn't get here this month, so we'll um, see how this goes. Uh, Brent Berniger, Berniger. Well, I'm glad I'm right after Roger since it's a little higher. <laughs> so, good afternoon, Chair uh, Peters, members of the board and the public. My name is Brent Berniger and I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Sacramento Regional Transit District. I'd really like to thank you for considering new funding opportunities for public transit. As the capital city and the fastest growing region in the state, we have an influx of new people constantly. Part of the consideration when moving to the area is looking at our transportation system. They look at it to find out if they can, if it meets their needs for commuting to work, going to public trans, uh, sorry, going to school, going to medical appointments and entertainment. So the reason SACRT is a great investment is we've been undergoing transformational major changes. We've been listening to the public and we've been implementing innovative ideas. In addition to that, we've improved our fiscal policies and our annual results have shown we're stronger than ever. Our teams have demonstrated the highest level of accountability. We've improved service, we've increased service levels, reduced fares, and we've built a modest reserve all along the way. We've bolstered partnerships and most recently with the help of the cities and the counties and the county, excuse me, we've launched the student free ride program. That program has been a great success. Already to date, we've had an increase in ridership for that group of population population of about 70 percent. Uh, our total ridership last year has grown 5 percent and now we're roughly about 22 million rides. With the injection of Measure A funds, the public will be given significantly more frequency options and more coverage and this will allow us to potentially double our ridership. With this new funds, our current transportation mode share could move from 2.3% to 4%. The investment can bring up to 7 billion less vehicle miles traveled while reducing up to 160 million tons of greenhouse gas. Traffic congestion on our freeways, local roads are now at capacity. <clears throat> so just think one bus can take 40 people off the road. One train can remove 600 cars from the road. This will definitely improve uh, air quality and congestion. So let's push for a cleaner, healthier, and more accessible Sacramento region through the support of public transportation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Neil Best. Mikey Chair and Board, my name is Neil Best. I'm with Best Consulting representing the California Mobility Center or the CMC as we refer to it. Um, so I just want to outline the vision and add a bit more of a description about what the centre is intending to do. So the vision, the Sacramento region is unique and it is where the most innovative technological economy in the world meets the leading global policy makers for clean energy and mobility. The California Mobility Centre provides the opportunity for these two worlds to combine and in so doing will help create the best solutions for future mobility that will solve the most pressing concerns we have around clean air, congestion, and equitable mobility. It will provide a unique opportunity to integrate local and state policies with industry expertise early in the innovation cycle to help define global standards for future mobility. The CMC already has strong regional support, not only from our utility provider SMUD, who you'll hear from, today, but also our two most prominent universities. Um, and we expect that regional support is going to continue to grow. We've already had very positive conversations with the county, the cities involved, um, Los Rios Community College as well. Uh, so it represents a true regionally backed initiative that will provide a platform to solve for global problems. The CMC will have multiple service lines to support for growing future mobility ecosystem, including services for rapid prototyping for new hardware, real world testing of EVs and infrastructure for a digital platform to integrate software solutions into hard tech. The CMC will accelerate the development and commercialization of mobility innovations that will help reduce emissions, congestions, and make the roads safer in general. It is intended to become a magnet for attracting thought leaders in the mobility space and in turn create many opportunities for a future workforce in electric and smart mobility solutions. So long-term support from Measure A will fund operations and staffing for the CMC nonprofit and it will allow it to operate in a way that it can focus on solving real transportation issues. Thank you. Yafio Borja.
And then Chris Brown. Apologies if I didn't get the, your pronunciation right. No, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, my parents got a little creative, so and they put up with me, so I appreciate that too. <laughs> thank you so much. Makes you think of them every day. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, <laughs> board members. My name is Joe Fabora. Uh, I work for the Sacramento Regional Transit. Clearly, we have a very passionate community members here. We have a very hardworking public works staff. We also have committed advocates, and we have consultants and folks from all measures of life watching us discuss here. I'd like to point out that the real battle is not the discussion that's gonna be happening in the room. What's gonna be happening is in November, we need to have a clear unified message to the members of the public that no matter what we discuss here, that we are willing to move the needle strictly in a pragmatic, sensible way that would hopefully address all of the issues that we have here in the county. Clearly, we do not have enough funding all throughout the state, let alone all throughout the county, to address the needs of our potholes. Uh, Supervisor Natoli in Vineyard, where I live, to my board members over at uh, Heritage Credit Union in Rancho Cordova, Council Member Gatewood, to my friends that live in South Sacramento, Council Member Guerra. But what we do have is an opportunity to tell a story that a pragmatic and sensible approach that gets everybody moving to the right direction is what we need to tell to the voters that yes, it is a good investment for you to invest in not only transit, to improve your roads, to have your congestion, <coughs> and for the folks who are not able to be here right now, the moms and dads having to ride two buses, the folks who are stuck in traffic 20 to 30 minutes in the 99 to 50 or, um, or the 80, that we are committed to improving their lives, and not only their lives, but the future generations that are not gonna be um, in, uh, in here to be able to vote on that in November. So I ask you, the rest of the chair, um, we all have a different and uh, varying ideas, but we are committed to making sure that whatever we put in the ballot there, that we're gonna be supportive 110% so that each and every members of the community do understand that we are not in this, not just for November 2020, but 40 years down the line. Thank you so much and we appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Chris Brown and then Nathan Dietrich. Good afternoon. I'm with the Sacramento Climate Coalition. Uh, my comments are going to be on two areas only. I happen to be, by just chance, one of the people that was interviewed during the polling process. Uh, it, at first, it was a little annoying because it was very clearly a push poll. They wanted repeatedly to give me options in which repairing roads or extending roads, especially the Southeast co uh, Coordinating Road, was the option that I was asked to support. And I kept telling the interviewer, that's not really what I'm, uh, I support. Where's transit in this? And it was always a later option in any of the ways she worded things. After a while, it became amusing because I had repeatedly said the same thing and we kind of, it became a bit of a joke. At no point was I offered an option where I could say, transit is the number one thing I'd like to support. So you should be aware of that when you're evaluating the results of your polling company uh, giving you their report. The second thing I'd like to talk about is uh, the broader issue and why I support the proposed to put more money into mass transit. It's clear that we need to get ro uh, cars off the road. It's one of the, it is the single largest <clears throat> source of greenhouse gases in our state, in our community, um, and we are facing a climate emergency right now, the, the disaster, the absolute tragedy that is happening in Australia could happen to us. For the last three years, we've broken records with wildfires here in California. The most deaths, the most area, the most property burned. Who knows when all of the 100 million trees that have died from the drought catch fire in the Sierras. We will see a fire that looks, that makes the Australian brush fire look like Ned in the first reader, as my dad used to like to say. So I believe you should support the alternative. I believe we should go further, but thank you very much for the time. Thank you. Nathan Dietrich. And then Cat. I was gonna let him introduce himself. I'm not Nathan. Yes, I <laughs> Yeah, Chair Peters, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to comment this afternoon. My name is Phil Garcia. I'm Vice President for Public Affairs and Advocacy at Sacramento State. 
I am here on behalf of the university today instead of uh, Mr. Dietrich. You do have a letter from President Nelson on the draft uh, Measure A expenditure plan, and I'd like to highlight a few points. First, uh, the university supports funding in the draft plan that prioritizes transit projects, pedestrian and bicycle access and safety, while also seeking to reduce traffic congestion on local highways and roads. Given these priorities, we respectfully request that the board consider funding for projects that would provide additional transit connections to and from the campus, as well as provide improved, safer, and more efficient bike and pedestrian access to Sac State. I want to share a few data points that underscore our needs, which if we can address, will in fact uh, help to reduce vehicle miles traveled to and from campus and reduce congestion on Highway 15 on uh, roads and, and thoroughfares near the campus. Since the last Measure A was passed in 2004, our enrollment has increased by more than 10% from just under 28,000 students to 31,150 last fall. Uh, the number of beds on campus has more than doubled since 2004. And in fact, when the Hornet Commons uh, project now being uh, constructed on the old McAuliffe ball fields is completed in 2021, the number of beds will increase to 3,300, more than triple the number in 2004. Uh, and in 2017, a university consultant found that within a three to five mile radius of campus, there were 140 rental properties that accounted for approximately 10,000 beds. So in the past year, we've endeavored to um, highlight our needs with uh, university representatives testifying before the STA board last April and more recently before the Sacramento City Council in October. The potential projects discussed included the following, a second Hornet, Hornet tunnel, tunnel in the vicinity of 67th Street to better align with RT's 65th Street light rail station. That's a project concept that is both in the city of Sacramento's general plan and the university's master plan. Uh, a shuttle between 65th Street light rail station and the campus, uh, bicycle and ped undercrossings across major thoroughfares and consideration of a new light rail station along Brighton Avenue. Could you wind up your comments, please? You're yes. over your two minutes. Uh, we finally, we very much appreciate our support of the, the inclusion of funding for a regional Mo mobility center in the draft plan. Thank you. Thank you. And Kat Gray, <clears throat> and after that, Laura Hamm. Could you clear the screen, please? Thank you. Hi, my name is Kat Gray. I'm an advocate with Sacramento Metro Advocates for Rail and Transit. I'm a Sac County resident of Folsom and a parent of two teenagers with a stake in the future. I'm concerned about climate change, but that's not why I'm here, because I know that your responsibility is to your constituents and not to the polar bears in the Arctic or the koalas in Australia, or even to the vulnerable people who are not most directly impacted by climate change. I'm here to ask you to make reasoned decisions about your, our transportation system that makes sense not just for today, but for the future as well. What will gas prices be like in 10 years? What will the population of Sacramento County be in 10 years? With demand and ridership of public transportation increasing, what will that demand look like in 10 or 20 years? We don't know for sure, but we know that the voters prioritize reducing congestion. We do know that the voters don't like being stuck in traffic. We do know that traffic congestion not only makes life more challenging for everyone, but it's not the foundation for an efficient or prosperous society. Prosperous societies have good, reliable public transportation systems that move people around efficiently. Now the voters are asking you to make decisions that reduce congestion. We know that congestion is most effectively reduced by investing in public transportation. We know that every dollar invested in public transportation is five times more effective at reducing congestion than a dollar spent on new roads. I bring this up because I get the feeling that there could be more support for public transportation from some of the members on this board. I understand that it's because ridership makes up a relatively small percentage of the population, but we need to take a look at the system and our, ask ourselves why are people driving more than using public transportation? How can we get more people onto the buses and light rail? How do we do that? Will we fund RT to the max so that they can provide our region with the best public transportation system possible? Personally, I think we need more than a half cent, um, but I'd like to ask you to at least adopt the alternative framework that's presented by SMART and SAC Moves. Thank you. Laura Hamm, and then Nelia Popardon. 
Good afternoon, I'm Laura Hamm with Sacramento Regional Transit District. I'd like to echo some of the comments of prior speakers. Am I echoing? Um, that state and federal agencies requiring greenhouse gas, vehicle miles travel reduction and, tra and transit oriented development in many projects. That these, um, many of the funds available to SACRT uh, as matching funds require those elements in their projects, that this benefits multiple agencies applying for grant funds and attracting workforce, housing and business. That a number of the projects um, identified in the transportation expenditure plan that our SACRT projects will be going to growing communities, including more microtransit service and on, in um, on demand service in new service areas, Gold Line Express service all the way to Folsom, the Green Line extension to the airport, extensions going to Elk Grove, new services in Citrus Heights, Arden Arcade, Carmichael, uh, Fair Oaks, Rancho Cordova, BRT, including um, uh, light rail optimization and modernization of our system, frequency in increases, and innovative first and last mile solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nelia Pope Harden. Uh, Renee John. Oh. Is Renee John here? No. Yeah, you look like you're trying to say something. I don't know what it is. Oh, okay. Thank you. David Kimball. Hi, uh, my name is David Rice Kimball and I represent myself. Uh, I'm currently retired, but for over 30 years I transported the public in taxi cabs and buses. For nine years, from 1993 till 2002, I drove buses for Paratransit Incorporated here in Sacramento. And in 1999, Paratransit's bus drivers organized into the Amalgamated Transit Union Local 256. I was elected as a contract co-negotiator and later as the first uh, Local 256 shop steward representing the Par Paratransit's drivers. Local 256 also represents regional transit drivers. A company union is a sham union. This is a little history. A company union is a sham union that prevents workers from organizing into a real labor union that would give them a voice in their working conditions. In the mid-1990s, a company union called the Independent Drivers Association, or IDA, became established at Paratransit that was not affiliated with any outside entity. For about three years, Paratransit management deducted monthly dues from drivers' paychecks on behalf of the IDA, but the IDA made no financial statement available to the drivers. In 1998, I wrote a letter requesting a financial statement and many of my fellow drivers signed on to this letter. When our letter was ignored, the U.S. Department of Labor in Oakland was contacted and a federal investigation initiated that resulted in the disbanding of the IDA at Paratransit Incorporated. Accountability and transparency are among the guiding principles of the Measure A Transportation Expenditure Plan. The public's investments will be far more effectively protected if a public entity, Sacramento Regional Transit, is the recipient of future Measure A funding. Paratransit Incorporated is a private corporation that operates also in Massachusetts and Washington State. Regional Transit is committed wholly, solely, and totally to this region and its riders. Beginning in late March, Regional Transit will begin performing ADA per transportation services. But if non-ADA service continues to be operated separately by Paratransit Incorporated, costs will be far greater and confusion among passengers as to which entity to contact for individual trips likely. Could you wind up your comments, please, Mr. RT Campbell? should perform both ADA and non-ADA services. Thank you. Henry Lee. To others, okay. Okay, you don't want to speak then. Okay. Um, L Larice Littman. What says Larice? Oh. Thank you, board. Uh, my name is Lori Littman. I'm president of 350 Sacramento, a local nonprofit organization committed to an equitable transition to a carbon zero future. I also serve as a commissioner on the Mayor's Commission on Climate Change. 
as you know, transporta the transportation sector is responsible for a large share of greenhouse gas emissions in our region. The Climate Commission recently voted unanimously to approve strategies to reduce individual car trips by 60% by 2030 and 80% by 2045. This approach is much more cost effective and healthy, a healthy way to reduce traffic congestion than building new roads and highways. We're in a time of great transition. Due to climate change, the future will not look like the past. You are in an unique position to make decisions that support the necessary changes in transportation, and the SACMOVE SMART framework is a good starting point. Instead of wish list, a wish list of projects, we need a holistic transportation plan to rapidly transition the transportation sector away from individual automobile trips to one that encourages walking, rolling, transit, and shared transportation. The co-benefits for our health, environment, economy, and quality of life are immense. So this is your moment to be bold in planning for a livable, sustainable future. Please embrace this opportunity. Thank you. Kate Mice or Mies? I don't see Kate. Okay. Don't see anybody getting up. Susie Murray? Not here. Not here. Thank you. Chris Norum? <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chris Norum with the North State Building Industry Association. I know we have a busy afternoon, so I'll be very brief. I just want to say, um, you know, I know that there are a number of alternatives being discussed right now, and I would just urge the board to take a balanced approach that allows us to direct funds to all modes of transportation that are needed in the area and that are uh, politically viable. Thank you. Thank you. Helen, o uh, Helen O'Connell, I don't see her. Mm -hmm. Helen's at the MAC meeting. Okay. Steve. Orcand. Okay. Hmm. Diang or Osorio Orson. Apologies, I'm sure I murdered that, but I'm not a handwriting expert. <laughs> After that will be Dale Page. I'm usually called Dwayne, so it's okay. Uh, my name is Diana Sorio. I'm the Mother Lord Chapter Director for the Sierra Club. Um, I just wanted to say a me too for we are part of the SAG Moves Coalition and we've been working on transportation for it's going to be four years, I feel now. Um, we just want, I want to urge you on behalf of our members that we are willing to work with you. There are economic benefits as well as the environmental uh, benefits and um, we don't want to miss this important opportunity to change the infrastructure of Sacramento, um, of the place we all love and we are all serving um, for the benefit of everyone and making sure that we're planning our future for people and not cars. Thank you. Thank you. Dale Page. Hello, I'm uh, Dale Page. I'm a member of SAC, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, I'm here to request you to please transform our transportation system to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Please adopt a policy that net zero vehicle miles travel will be required of all SDA funded projects. The facts of progressive climate warming are clear. Global temperature is increasing, tropical storms are becoming more dangerous, polar ice caps are melting, the sea level is rising, and wildfires are increasingly out of control. One billion animals have died in the current Australian wildfire season which is just beginning. Climate change is truly an issue which we need to come to grips with for the sake of our children, for the sake of our grandchildren, and for the sake of life as we know it. 
It is this life, incomparably precious, that distinguishes our planet in this vast universe. It is this life that we must ensure is preserved. Transportation emissions are growing in California and locally. Under SB 375, we are responsible to reduce local greenhouse gas emissions. We need you, our leaders here on the Sacramento Transit Authority Board, to lead us into a better future. To take action to help prevent unmitigated global warming. Vehicle miles tra traveled is the best measurable and forecastable indicator of greenhouse gas emissions. Please adopt a policy that net zero VMT be required of all SDA funded projects. And please require that the Caltrans SB 743 procedures be applied to all projects funded by the SDA TEP, whether they already have passed environmental uh, review or not. Thank you. Dane Palm or Palmer. And then Mark Ralson. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, obviously, um, I support a measure that puts public transportation and other m means of transport like that over uh, car traffic and everything else for all the reasons obviously stated. Uh, I'd like to see funding prioritized for obviously safety and security concerns on, on public transportation, mm -hmm. also for transportation to be extended in times and maybe different areas. Uh, obviously people have needs to get to jobs that they can't access and other places. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it. I also want to say that I support what the previous speaker said about the bike lane issue as well. Something that just kind of came to my mind as well because I've been hit twice myself. So there needs to be some additional bikes and I think the main focus should be on public transportation. Uh, better service, uh, extended hours, um, and I think that the majority of this funding should go to that. Obviously, roads are an essential part of that, but uh, I think that's how we're going to move forward. So, thank you. Mar M Mark Rawson. Mark Rawson couldn't be here in person. My name is Subid Wagley. I work for SMUD. Um, I'm here to seek your support for the California Mobility Center, which also I'm a project manager for. Incorporated as nonprofit last year, the California Mobility Center, or CMC, aims to be the leading global innovation for future <laughs> mobility solutions. Um, our initial founding members include SMUD, Sac State, Los Rios Community College, and UC Davis, with strong support from City of Sacramento. Uh, SMUD has taken a leadership role in the design and launch of the CMC because of its strong alignment with our integrated resource plan, which has a goal to attain net zero carbon emissions for region by 2040. Uh, we intend to invest $2 billion over the next 20 years to electrify the transportation sector and electrify buildings in order to attain its goal. We've committed $15 million, as our SMUD board has approved, to the CMC to help get it established. Other regional partners are stepping up as well. Sac State is committing 25 acres located in Sacramento's Innovation Zone, located off Power and Road, that will be home to the CMC. Los Rios is seeking $40 million in bond financing to construct advanced manufacturing facility to support the CMC and train its students to be the workforce to support the CMC and this industry. Other local, regional, and state governments are supporting this and looking at ways to contribute. Our five-year startup costs are estimated to be $80 million, of which ongoing annual operating costs will be approximately $5 million. Uh, 1.5 million annually in support from Measure A will go a long way and will help the CMC on an operational basis with support from staffing of a nonprofit who will support industry clients coming to CMC. This ongoing long-term support and commitment are very helpful to allow CMC to <coughs> operate in a way that is sustainable. So Thank we you. appreciate your uh, you. consideration to support this regional effort. Thank you. Uh, Adrian Wren, Rain. Got it. Close? Yeah, close. Really close. 
Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Wren. You got it. Um, from Valley Vision, I'm a project manager representing our uh, 11 staff and 30 member board uh, today. Um, for 25 years, Valley Vision has uh, been at the forefront of civic leadership in the region um, on issues of economic prosperity, social equity, and environmental sustainability. Uh, so air quality, public health, and transportation go hand in hand. Um, as members of the Joint Mayor's Commission on Climate Change, we at Valley Vision agree with the principles laid out in the Alternative Expenditure Plan uh, developed by our partners at SAC Moves and SMART. Um, that this effort should result in no net increase in vehicle miles traveled, VMT, uh, or greenhouse gas emissions, GHGs. As such, we welcome the assessment of both the draft TEP and the leading alternative brought forward by our partners uh, to ensure informed decision making by the STA board and ultimately voters in our communities. We further encourage STA to identify additional resources for our local air quality management district, which is doing critical work to improve public health and bring leading edge mobility options to our communities and whose needs amount to more than the current provision of 1.5%. We look forward to continued collaboration to ensure sound investments in transportation that improve regional mobility and promote an inclusive economy. Thanks. Thank you. Olga Sanchez. Then Jeffrey Tardigia. And after Jeffrey will be Doug Thompson. Now that you've seen that one, we'll punch, punch that one up and tell you this is the Sacramento News Review this week. Hopefully you people will read it, see it, look at it. Um, more importantly here I will say to you is, is when is the last time that you um, people, and I will say, Jeff, you had the chance with some Rotary Clubs, some back with uh, Joshua at the Marconi. Eric, you've had some opportunities likewise to talk about this. Patrick, I'm a little disappointed in the Measure M and the other things through there that of Los Angeles, and you're going to hear more about Los Angeles repeatedly now, but um, dealing with the fact of, hey, simple. You need to get out there. This is a public transportation tax. Doesn't even come close to meeting the needs, the wants, or anything else. But you need to convince people this is where we have to start. At the same time, you need to get out of your boxes and consider what else is going on. Master plan and aging. Right now you have 500,000 seniors. 10 years you're going to have 5 million. How in the world are you addressing the possibility of their needs and what is going to be happening? Climate. Temperature is going to go up to 120 degrees. How are you addressing those needs and aspects for public transportation? It's going to be a lot of changes. You also have to figure out you're not the body that's going to do this, but you need to make suggestions of how in the world you replace and get our legislators to replace the gas tax. We need to figure out better ways of funding these elements and processes. For you in Folsom and for you in Elk Grove, you've had a commuter system that works. Now you need to have convincingly where how in the world the residents, the small 1%, and that's both the blind, the disabled, as well as those that are, shall we say, have total dependence on vehicle transportation, that even though they are using the cars all the time, what this will do, help get congestion off of the highways, the roads, so that there is better public transportation. Thank you. Doug Thompson? And Andrew Fields. Did the lights just go out out there? No? Is Mr. Thompson not here? Doug Thompson is not here. Okay. 
Good afternoon, Chair Peters and the board. I uh, appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, my name is Andrew Fields from AMF Strategies, representing the Sacramento Regional Transportation Coalition. Uh, first and foremost, I want to commend all of you for uh, your direction in the more collaborative process that we're dealing with now than we did in 2016. I know your team has been out listening to the residents of the county. You've spent uh, uh, countless resources in trying to figure out what the needs and the wants of the county are, and it's felt much more collaborative than in 2016. And you guys get a lot of credit for that, so I appreciate that. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, over the last three election cycles, just in the last three election cycles, I worked for an organization called the California Alliance for Jobs. I'm not with them anymore, but in those three election cycles, I've helped pass tax measures in Alameda County, San Mateo, Marin County, uh, Stanislaus, Merced, Santa Cruz, San Benito, Santa Clara County, and I'm sure I'm missing one, but it's been a lot. And the only reason I say that is because in a number of, in, on a list of people in the state that know more about self-help, county tax uh, campaign uh, passage and, and expenditure plans, I've gotta be in the top five of that list. And I think you can probably ask your, your new staff member, Will, to, uh, to attest to that as well. And Will, I don't know what made you think that you could put your feet back in the fire during this uh, very uncontroversial uh, uh, topic, but uh, welcome back and we're, we're glad to have you here. Uh, SAC RTC uh, has presented an alternative plan. I know that you have a couple of alternative plans in front of you. We've presented another, and I appreciate your consideration in that moving forward. I want to give you a little bit of background about that plan. You've heard a lot of passionate talk today from members of all different uh, uh, walks of life and from all different corridors of the county. Uh, this is not going to be a passionate plea. This is about what the voters want and what the voters... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, is this my time left or... Okay, sorry, I, was, I, didn't, I didn't see a clock up there earlier. Um, I'll just, I'll, I'll summarize. You have a plan in front of you. I'll be happy to, to answer questions from any of you individually afterwards. But this is about what the voters want, what the voters need, and, and what the county can do to put forth a, uh, a measure that will reach a two-thirds threshold that's extremely difficult to reach. It's about uh, allowing the local municipalities freedom in deciding what's best for their uh, constituents and moving money into projects that really have an impact on people's lives, congestion management uh, as well as transit. So uh, with that, I appreciate your time and uh, Will has my contact information. I'll be happy to contact uh, any of you individually uh, or to entertain questions, Mr. Natoli. Yeah, excuse, that's my job. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Natoli. I just, I saw that he was going to yeah. ask a question. I said, all right, I'll stand here. I'll Thank answer you. questions. That's fine. Thank you. Have we gotten you did a copy of your materials, though? I don't, I, I was just looking through the things that have come through in the last few days, Andrew, so if you could make sure that we get copies of SAC RTCs. Uh, we'll have a copy electronically. He'll be happy to present that. And, and the copies that have been passed out, I apologize for the tiny font, but I uh, wanted to keep it to one page for you guys. We, we've got so many handouts, it may take us a while yeah, to I find understand. it. Okay, no, good. That's, that's I, perfectly okay. acceptable. For the material, Andrew, that's why I was The talking. important okay. part is that we look forward to working with you guys going forward and, and finding yeah, well, an expenditure okay. plan okay. that uh, that can meet the needs of the county. And, oh, let's and, get the trees out. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fields. Good. Okay, thank, thank you. I wanted to make sure I called Doug Thompson, I, but I, he's not. He's not. He okay. So, yeah. Okay. We didn't okay. Stephen Green, and then Lynn Wheat. Good afternoon, Chair Peters and members of the board. I'm Stephen Green, Save the American River Association. There are many good projects being proposed here for this tax measure. There's one, however, that has a great deal of concern. And that is a new bridge across the American River through Discovery Park at Truxell. <coughs> this bridge would provide tracks for regional transit, um, also for pedestrians and bicycles, and four lanes of vehicle traffic. The American River Parkway plan, which was approved by three of the supervisors over here today, does not provide for vehicle traffic for this bridge, only regional transit and pedestrian and bicycles. Uh, it will have to be, the plan will have to be amended if this goes forward. Also, thanks to Roger Dickinson, this plan was placed into state law, so it would require legislation as well if you're going to put four lanes of uh, vehicle traffic there. I really want to be able to vote for this proposal, but we cannot do that if you're going to put four new lanes 
of traffic across the American River there at Truxell. There are probably other options. Uh, Councilman Ashby in Sacramento has proposed expanding uh, I-5. Also, there are bridges immediately upstream from Truxell that could be expanded. There's even a possibility of a tunnel, but I hope we consider those. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Wheat. And then Joanne Fuller. Good afternoon. My name's Lynn Wheat, and I'm a resident of Elk Grove. And what I want to speak to today is what's been going on to Elk, in Elk Grove. We have an area called SEPA that was to be our job center. The citizens, residents of Elk Grove front loaded the money for the new infrastructure out to the SEPA area. And lo and behold, the first project in our SEPA area that's supposed to be a job creator is 499 homes. So while they're uh, spending our money on new roads that nobody's using quite yet, our current city roads are in demise and falling apart. We do have a public works uh, department that has been working on that, but still they're behind and don't have the money. And it was such that I um, uh, nominated El the city of Elk Grove for uh, Domino's paving for potholes. Um, I didn't receive a response. I don't think that we were awarded that. I probably should have done it at a county level. I believe that we need to look at transportation, in particular light rail. I've been advocating for that in Elk Grove since we became a city. And our initial council said to me, it's too costly. So this was 20 years ago. So I would said, it's going to be too costly not to. And we're going to have some impacts from that, public health impacts. I'd like to see our money go towards transportation. That's fair. I don't want to see it go for a JPA connector in Elk Grove. Our general plan was just recently updated, and it is a pro-growth policy, urban sprawl, which will then it impact all of us within the county, not just Elk Grove itself. Our residents already pay huge assessments on their property bills that are not fixed. If we're going to go forth and we're going to ask them for a sales tax increase, it should be to fix our roads and bring us better transportation. We have an aging population that would like that public transportation, and many millennials choose not to drive and want to be where there's access to that transportation. So we're Thank not going to be able to build our way out of the traffic problem in Elk Grove. To so wind please. up your comments, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Joanne Fuller. And then Julia Randolph. Chair and board, I'm Joanne Fuller. I live in Supervisor Peters' district. You know, I, I know a lot of people are coming to you saying uh, you should do the same thing as you did uh, where we that was defeated three years ago. And I'm noticing that a lot of things have changed from the uh, three years ago uh, in uh, 2016, uh, four years now, I guess. Um, you know, um, instead of doing the same thing, what we're noticing is that a lot more uh, folks are talking about climate change as we see the dramatic effects of climate change and understand that we need to do things differently. We're uh, up against state mandates that we have to meet, and I'm hoping that uh, the kind of uh, programs that you will put into place will help us meet those um, if effectively. Um, because of a lack of federal help uh, we see in the future, we understand that we need more money to <clears throat> uh, act as matching, uh, our county's matching to uh, new grants. <clears throat> we need to maintain the roads we have. People are uh, driving over many, many potholes, and we need to have those roads repaired to uh, the uh, correct level before we uh, use additional roads, before we uh, talk about doing additional roads that will need to be maintained. Uh, we need alternative transportation for seniors that shouldn't be driving, uh, like myself, for uh, the disabled, for younger people. Uh, we need uh, to address the need for safer streets. You know, we hear Glenn talking about his experience, and we know a lot of kids and a lot of folks are in that situation. We need better air quality. Um, you know, um, we really are understanding uh, the benefits of RT, and RT has changed, and a lot of people are noticing that too. So um, I'm hoping that you won't think that 
uh, the problems that we are facing now are going to be defeated by the old-fashioned um, uh, elements of the plan that was defeated. Thank you. Thank you. Julia Randolph and then Will Barrett. Hi, I work for the Coalition for Clean Air and we appreciate the opportunity to speak on the expenditure plan today. Um, according to the American Lung Association, the greater Sacramento area is the fifth worst, most polluted area in the nation due to smog. So we aren't meeting state or federal air quality standards, which not only jeopardizes the health of our residents, but air quality non-attainment can jeopardize our region's federal transportation funding. Um, the city of Sacramento's data shows half of Sacramento's greenhouse gas emissions result from gas fueled transportation. And as one of the fastest growing regions in the state, it is critical for us to develop a sustainable multimodal transportation model to not strain existing transport options, uh, promote or promote sprawl development or increase vehicles, miles traveled and emissions. The current expenditure plan has funding towards widening or new roads as congestion measures, but contrarily, according to the Victoria Transport Policy Institute, building more roads encourages more people to drive <coughs> and is fiscally unsustainable. <coughs> um, it is immoral to the voters to spend their tax dollars on congestion relief measures that have been proven not to work and increase their public health hazards. Also, this is a sales tax measure, which will be paid for um, by everyone, whether they have a car or not. Um, our low income population often do not own cars, but are harmed the most by the negative health effects in the transportation sector. This plan needs to be equitable and access, uh, accessible for all of our residents. Um, we urge you to adopt a sustainable <clears throat> package that will improve air quality, reduce congestion, enhance safety, improve, and improve access and affordability. Thank you. Thank you. Will Barrett, then Albert Fox. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Will Barrett with the American Lung Association uh, here in Sacramento. Um, so first off, just public health, clean air, and a stable climate all stem from the local decisions that we're discussing today. So um, I appreciate the attention that you're putting to that. Um, as just noted, our annual state of the air report uh, that the Lung Association puts out every year shows that Sacramento is the fifth most polluted county or uh, metropolitan area in the United States for ozone pollution or summertime smog. Uh, we're also in the top 20 for the most polluted county in the United States for the same reason. There are over 100,000 children and, and adults living with asthma in the county, uh, along with hundreds of thousands of other uh, <coughs> residents dealing with heart disease, diabetes low socioeconomic status and other conditions that make them more susceptible and, and vulnerable to the effects of unhealthy air. Um, transportation pollution is by far the dominant source of our smog problem in California and certainly in Sacramento. Uh, we also know that climate change is making the job of cleaning up the air that much more difficult in California and around the world. Uh, we know that the um, the last two statewide in inventories of greenhouse gas emissions have shown increases in transportation carbon, and that just makes our job more difficult as we see more increased heat, uh, extreme heat events, wildfires, all making the job of cleaning up the air locally uh, that much more difficult. The Air Resources Board's uh, 2018 progress report uh, on sustainable communities and healthy communities really shows that we're off track in terms of our local uh, and statewide decisions as um, <clears throat> making, the, uh, making our um, ability to achieve our clean air standards that much more difficult and our climate standards that much more difficult. Um, I would say to you that uh, public funding really should not be put to projects that increase vehicle miles traveled, increase ozone pollution, increase carbon pollution. There's too much at stake, too much at risk uh, for the health of lo our local communities to be supporting projects that put us and our clean air goals further out of reach. With that, I thank you for your, uh, your time and attention to this important matter. Thank you. Al Fox, then James Corliss. Madam Chair and members of the committee, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. Thank you. Hi, Al. Uh, I'm here just simply as Albert Fox, resident of Citrus Heights and of North Sacramento. First of all, I have to say, doing the same thing the same way and expecting different results never works. This commission, this committee, uh, and the prior uh, funding has been a disaster for some areas. A tremendous amount of money that was expected was never gotten. 
Uh, Citrus Heights is one of those that they only received 5.1 million of the current projected of which was supposed to be 17.7. Several of the other areas received nothing under the old plan and under the old administration um, that was in charge of handling those funds. No blame being laid here, just simple, it's time to wake up. This is what the voters are seeing. It's a failure to perform, and we need to get past that. Some of the things that happened, sales tax and Citrus Heights generated $56.7 million towards this former measure, of which they've only seen $28.4 million in return. When we sat here in one meeting, there was a request by one jurisdiction to knock $3 million of what money was supposed to get to Citrus Heights out of the funding in support of their area of work because it was more important for what they were trying to do than improve the streets of Northern Sac. Between <coughs> Supervisor Peters, Supervisor Frost, and the city of Citrus Heights, we abut the county of Northern County of Sacramento from Watt Avenue to Folsom and south to Rancho Cordova. Through Citrus Heights and that area of from Watt over, we have eight of the ten major roadways that support and supply people, goods, and transportation to jobs, to equipment, and to the things they need to work every day. Every one of those thoroughfares, those roads, are major surface streets that need to have a lot of work done. That doesn't include the residential and commercial areas within those jurisdictions that also need to be supported. <clears throat> if you're going to do a measure, make sure that the communities that you're trying to represent and the expenditures of those funds get there. Otherwise, you're not going to get the support. And I can guarantee it only takes somebody the size of Citrus Heights to vote against a measure that will stop it from becoming a two-thirds vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. James Corliss and then Mark Loudsenheiser. Chair Peters, members of the board, uh, James Corliss from the Sacramento Area Council of Governments. Uh, just wanted to give you an update as the December STA board meeting. We were, um, it, we were asked to look at uh, some of the larger capital projects uh, being discussed for the expenditure plan along with the Air District. Uh, we are in process of that. Uh, I expect probably about another couple of weeks, maybe two more weeks, and we should have something for you. We want to meet with some of the project sponsors and vet some more data, but we're working on it, so stay tuned. Uh, we haven't forgotten that request, and we'll be back to you in a couple of weeks. Um, happy to answer any questions, and I think the Air District is here next. Okay, if you'd hold on just a second, yeah. Mr. Uh, Chenier so I just, had a question for you. Well, not quite a question, but um, I'd like to request that uh, materials that they're working on, if they're done in time for the February 5th meeting, that we get those presented to the board. And we're working with your executive director closely as well in terms of the scope of the project. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Mark Lautzenheiser representing the Sacramento Urban Quality Management District and just actually echoing a little bit of what uh, James Corliss just mentioned as well, that we are working collaboratively to address the questions that this board did pose to both of our agencies at the last board meeting, taking a look at the air quality and conformity impacts of some of the larger projects, the impacts of vehicles mile traveled on the greenhouse gas emission projects, and with the hope that we'll be able to bring something more formal to your February board meeting as an actual agenda item so you can have that information in more detail. And with that, unless you have any questions, thank you for your time. Thank you. Owen Rout, R-O-U-T-T. -T. Oh, thank you. I'm a local resident. I live in Natomas, and I'd like to uh, ask the STA to focus more of its efforts on public transportation uh, with the end goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, and slowing in and at least ameliorating some of the more negative impacts of climate change that we were already seeing, huge wildfires in California across the globe, uh, the loss of, of species that are directly related to greenhouse gas emissions uh, and climate change. And I think that, uh, as someone else said, uh, the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. If we build more roads, we'll have more vehicle miles traveled uh, and we'll have more and more of the same issues that we're seeing now uh, in regards to climate change uh, and continued environmental degradation in California, uh, which is just such a shame um, given the, the, the beauty and diversity of our state. And I think that each one of you here has a personal mm -hmm. responsibility to address those issues uh, for the public good. Thank you. Thank you. Edith Thatcher.
Hi, thank you for your time. I'm Edith Thatcher, and I'm with the Citizens Climate Lobby, and um, we have about 1,200 members in the um, Sacramento region. Uh, our, our mandate is to muster the political will for a livable world, and therefore the matters um, here today are very much of concern to us. Our, our belief is that your committee should take quite seriously what the gentleman from the American Lung Association said. You are looking at the nexus of clean air, public health, and climate change, and anything that you can do in the future to reduce our greenhouse gases and our dependence on uh, single occupancy vehicles can only improve our future and that of our children. So Citizens Climate Lobby comes down strongly in support of the SMART framework. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Corey Brown. I only have one more speaker signed up after Mr. Brown, so if you're holding on to your card because you want to be last, now's the time to get it in. Okay. Great. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, and members of the uh, agency. My name is Corey Brown. I'm an attorney with Resources Legacy Fund. We're a nonprofit group based in Sacramento, but we work on natural resources issues, equity housing issues around California and the West. We've uh, been very uh, involved in a number of transportation issues over the years. We helped build support for successful sales tax measures in San Diego, Orange County, and most recently in Los Angeles. We've worked on many statewide uh, ballot measures that created billions of dollars of funding in the conservation and water areas. I wanted to echo the comments from the SMART uh, Coalition. I think that their uh, advice takes you in the right direction. I want to encourage you to go further to actually adopt a measure that will fund reductions in VMT in Sacramento, uh, given the urgency of uh, air pollution, climate, and others. As a resident with asthma, I want to echo the American Lung Association's comments. One of the important things the measure can also do is protecting natural resources like the American River through uh, advanced mitigation funds and other steps. In our work in housing, one of the things we've noticed is that, of course, affordability is a key issue for housing in, Ca in Sacramento. Households look at the combined cost of housing and transportation. One of the most important ways you can affect overall housing costs and overall household costs is give people alternatives from having to have cars or having to use cars. Households from analysis we've conducted in Sacramento and elsewhere show that households can save several thousand dollars by not having to have cars or not having to have as many cars if they have good alternatives, whether it be public transportation, bicycles, uh, walkability by uh, having uh, uh, being closer to work, to schools, and others. We believe this measure can be significantly improved, and, we'll, and by improving it along the lines of uh, what many of the speakers today, including the Smart Coalition, mentioned, will actually make your measure more viable. Uh, we uh, urge you to uh, make this measure something that's going to help improve our air quality, transportation. We look forward to working with you on this. Thank you. Thank you. Jill Peterson will be our last speaker on this item. Good afternoon, I'm Jill Peterson. I'm a resident of Sacramento County and a member of Citizens Climate Lobby and Sacramento 350. Um, I wanna urge you to consider alternatives to adding more roads. As um, one of my uh, colleagues has said, the groups I'm part of are very concerned about climate change. And I think the city has taken some great steps in um, having the commission, mayor's commission. And I see us moving in the right direction there. Unfortunately, the county hasn't <coughs> done a similar, taken similar steps. But as we start moving in the direction of trying to do something meaningful here in Sacramento about climate change, transportation is key. And I know that point has been made over and over today. But I would just like to, again, echo my um, support for what the SMART recommendations were, that we really focus the future on building a future for our kids. Um, thank you. Thank you. OK. Are there any comments from the board before we go on to the presentation of the ordinance? Is that a yes or a no? Yes, Mr. Hansen. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank all the people who came back. I know that uh, last board meeting was not what any of us uh, wanted, but I really appreciate the folks who came and spoke. And what I can tell is that for all the people here, there's so many other people out there watching this decision, not only because uh, we're reading about it in the paper and um, seeing it on social media, but this is a critical decision for the future of our, our county, our city. And um, it's going to take all of you working together with us to make sure we do this right. And that's why I'm glad you came back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you also uh, for, for coming back. And again, apologies for running out of time last, at our last meeting. Um, <clears throat> as you probably know, there have been continuing discussions with stakeholders and the public regarding this plan, but we haven't made any changes to the plan until we got to hear from all of you today. So uh, we're going to go on now to the presentation of the draft Measure A 2020 ordinance for discussion purposes only. And Mr. Kempton will start, and then Mr. Burke has a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. At today's meeting, we're presenting proposed ordinance number STA 20-01, an ordinance providing for a one-half percent of re retail trans transactions and use tax for local transportation purposes in Santa Clara. In Santa Clara. Um, I started my self-help county business in Santa Clara County, and that was many years ago. Sorry about that in Sacramento County. The document entitled the Transportation Maintenance, Safety and Congestion Relief Act is presented today as the chair indicated for discussion purposes only and is now available to the public for review and comment. An ordinance is required under the provisions of the California Revenue and Taxation Code and the Public Utilities Code for implementation of a retail transaction and use tax at the local level. This ordinance lays out the rules and guidelines for implementing a transaction and use tax program and must be consistent to the greatest degree possible with state law so that the tax can be administered and collected by the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, the uh, successor agency to the uh, Board of Equalization on these matters. The proposed ordinance provides for the imposition of a retail transactions and use tax of one half of one percent for local transportation pur purposes for a period of 40 years. It is divided into three sections, the actual ordinance language itself. Uh, exhibit A is actually the expenditure plan, and Exhibit B includes taxpayer safeguards. Development of the proposed ordinance was based on legal requirements and the format and structure of previous ordinances for the same purpose approved by the authority in 2004 for the existing Measure A and 2016 for the proposed uh, Measure B. Again, no action is required today. We're advising the public and stakeholders that a new ordinance has been proposed. And following this meeting, we will be forwarding the draft ordinance to the Department of Tax and Fee Administration for their review as to format and consistency with state law. We will also continue to take public input and comment, uh, and uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, additional uh, input over the next series of meetings. And I believe now, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Burke. Are there any questions time. for Mr. Kempton? Okay, uh, Mr. Burke. Thank you. Uh, I do have comments on two separate provisions in the ordinance. Hopefully you all received my email uh, with the attached memo earlier this week on Monday. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the same two issues here. The first provision is your maintenance of effort provision. As you all know, uh, your governing statute requires that any revenues coming from a sales tax measure cannot be used by receiving entities to replace or offset their existing revenues dedicated to uh, transportation purposes. <clears throat> and the way that you address that in the uh, existing Measure A ordinance was to uh, implement the countywide transportation mitigation fee program. Uh, which required receiving entities to basically adopt ordinances or ensure that they are imposing transportation impact fees as a way of preserving the uh, impact fees that they had been collecting prior to current Measure A. So I'm looking in particular at Exhibit A, page A1 of the proposed ordinance. And if you all look at it, uh, paragraph B on page A1, <coughs> So I had, I had interpreted this provision as requiring the continued implementation by uh, member agencies of the countywide transportation 
mitigation fee program. Uh, after talking with Mr. Kempton, he pointed out that it could be interpreted in a different way, that perhaps it means that the current mitigation fee programs at the local level can lapse when the current Measure A expires in 2039. So the issue for you, I think, is to decide what you want this new measure to say. Um, my recommendation would be in order to comply with the statutory requirement for local entities to maintain their effort, my recommendation would be to have the receiving entities continue to implement their local uh, countywide transportation mitigation fee programs. Uh, the other option is to let that lapse in 2039 with the current uh, measure. And at that point, you wouldn't have the same comprehensive way of enforcing the maintenance of effort requirement. You'd have to, you'd have to implement some kind of ad hoc audit effort to make sure all the local agencies are complying. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. We don't have to decide today, but that's an issue that you'll want to resolve before. So if we uh, make a change, we can bring it forward when we bring the final? When we formally introduce right. the ordinance in a couple okay. of months. All right. The second issue is the air quality conformity issue. So as I said in my memo to you, uh, you can certainly include a provision that requires any projects that are receiving Measure A revenue to conform to the state implementation plan and, and or be included in the MTP. And that's mostly what this current provision says. However, it also includes language that says that the STA board can determine what conformity is. And legally, that's not your role. That's for SACOG and ultimately for <coughs> EPA. Um, so that language I find to be problematic. Uh, it would be more straightforward if the provision just said that projects receiving Measure A revenue conform to the SIP or, or are included in the MTP or words to that effect. So. Um, my recommendation would just to do a, a easy delete of the last clause of that provision. Sorry, it's on page A2, paragraph H. And you want us to delete what part of it? The last clause that says, as determined by the Sacramento Transportation Authority Governing Board. That's the language that purportedly allows you to make a conformity determination. Okay. That's something we can also change when the yeah. final order yes. is presented. Yes, and, and I, I would say that if this, you may recall, those of you who were here three years ago, this was a subject of some debate at the, at the hearing where we decided on the final language. Um, if that language is to be retained, and if I were to give it an interpretation, I would have to interpret it as basically creating an override option for this board to vote on going forward for the life of the new measure that you could vote to that there's a, there's a policy to have these projects that are funded co conform to the SIP, but you could override it. You could waive that policy if nine of you voted to do so. That's how I would have to interpret that if it stays in. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kemp, did you have any comment on that? I do not, Madam Chair. I think your uh, comment about uh, considering that and bringing it back at a, to a future meeting is, uh, is uh, okay. on the mark. Thank you. Mr. Natoli? Excuse me, just, just a question. Bill, you sent this on with a confidential header on it, so is this now available since you've now explained it here in the nope. public? <clears throat> the memo is still confidential. Oh, it is. Well, you just explained all, you just went through the whole memo when you were explanation, so. Well, maybe some of it. Okay. I summarized it. All right, well, I just want to be sure, so I, as, as you're you know, re relaying this in this setting and giving you know, to, to the chair the ability to ha revisit this, I just didn't. Okay, so. Well, if you want to waive the privilege, I guess, well, well it takes nine I, of you to vote to do that. Okay. Well, again, I just think it was a good explanation, and, and I didn't share this with anybody, but I also take it seriously when I see that header, so. Yeah. Okay. Council can neither hey, confirm wait. nor deny that his comments were just uh, <laughs> He did a good job explaining what's in here, so I, I'm fine hey, with Bob Ryan would have said no. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Sue Frost. Oh, so essentially what that is saying is that, uh, for instance, the connector, if the, there was a portion of the connector that was not in the MTP, 
but they had federal funds and could move forward if they had matching funds with their major A, they would not be able to move forward um, if it was not in, within the um, MTP or the MSIP, MTIP. Right, well, okay, if there's a segment of the connector that is not in the MTP, then it's not gonna be able to get federal funds or federal permitting, uh, but if this provision remains as it is written, I would interpret it as allowing the board to vote to go ahead and allocate local funds anyway. Because okay. it, it purports to allow this board to make a conformity determination. That's the best way I can, I can interpret that language to give it meaning. Okay. Um, so since we're on that page, I, uh, I have a question and that kind of relates to, to this also because um, I believe it relates to it. Um, in, in the, or is there, or is there more of a presentation that's gonna happen right now or is this a time to ask questions relating to the <coughs> expenditure plan and the ordinance? Uh, through the chair, um, uh, Supervisor Frost, there's no additional presentation associated okay. with this item. Okay, good. So I have a question that, that relates to uh, page A2 uh, and item I uh, under revenue estimate. And I, I know we had a lot of discussions around the polling and um, the results of the polling and how important it was to uh, the constituents to have uh, some safe, uh, you know, some assurity that the money would go the way they thought it was gonna be spent and that the, the funds would not be redistrib redistributed in different ways. And throughout the ordinance and the expenditure plan, there were several references to the, um, the way uh, the revenue estimates and um, there were, um, I'm gonna make sure I say this right. Uh, there were uh, multiple references to uh, amendments that could be made to the expenditure plan and how there would be um, a possibility that after the first year and then every 10 years, the board could um, make a would review the expenditure plan and make adjustments and that a majority of the incorporated cities and county would need to be on board with that, which I get. I, I think that's important because over 40 years is a long time. Uh, in this <coughs> item I, under revenue estimate, there's a, um, a statement at the very end of the statement that refers to there's, there are only, um, the authority board shall make periodic allocation adjustments to reflect actual revenues received but may not amend the formula allocation set forth in this expenditure plan except as permitted in this ordinance number STA 2001, which is the ordinance that we're discussing right now, or section 180207 of the Public Utilities Code. And so um, it's pretty clear in the ordinance um, what the regulation is, but then when I went and looked up the section 180207 of the Public Utilities Code, it basically, and, and I, can, I can pass that, this out if anyone's interested in, in looking at it, you can pass that down. Um, basically what it says is that the authority may annually review and propose amendments to the county transportation expenditure plan adopted pursuant to section 180206 to provide for use of additional federal, state, local funds or to account for unexpended, uh, unexpected revenues or to take into consideration unforeseen circumstances, which is a pretty wide open. The authority shall notify the board of supervisors and the city council of each city in the county to provide them with a copy of the proposed amendments the proposed amendments shall become effective 45 days after notice is given. So basically, um, the way I have, um, the way I read this, 
and I can give you a copy of this if you want. I don't know. Oh, you got it. I got it. Um, uh, with the way I read this is with a simple majority under a very broad circumstance, almost any circumstance, this board under this ordinance would have the authority to change the expenditure plan and make adjustments, a broad a range of adjustments on an annual basis and all they have to do is notify everyone and give them 45 day notice. And I, I, I just wanted to make sh clarify that do I understand that correctly? And then, um, and if I do, it's kind of, it, it, it kind of, um, kind of hit me because this is the whole thing that in the polling, the whole reason for the polling was to kind of get a feel for how the citizens feel. And this is the reason why people are leery. And this is when I, and when I talk to taxpayer groups, in fact, I've talked to taxpayer groups about this very um, thing because I this <coughs> this measure a I really felt I felt like I saw a path to something we could get past and I, I was thinking if the taxpayer groups could get on board um, as you know putting their stamp of approval on it it would also I could also feel comfortable that that would help us but um, this is the kind of thing that uh, and what and their response to me was, <clears throat> Sue, we don't trust that it's going to go that way. It never goes that way. Uh, there's always something hidden in there, and this is the kind of thing that um, that tax that causes taxpayers to not trust us. And the reason we are trying to figure out how can we get them to want to work with us on this. So I'm I would like some clarification on this, as to. Um, do we work under, do we have to work under the public utilities code or can we just eliminate that part of the sentence that, you know, that very end of that sentence and take that out so that we have um, this, uh, a more clear, um, stronger safeguards in place for what the um, public would like to see? Um, are we, or are we required to work under the public utilities code? So you can't, yes, you are required to take the code as it is. Um, the code, that provision gives the board the option under certain circumstances, the circumstances that you read, if there are additional unexpected revenues um, and then unforeseen circumstances, yes, that's the one that's kind of um, undefined. Um, I don't think in the past 10 years this board has seized on that language, on that provision to change the current expenditure plan at all. But that option's always been there. Hmm. Um, you know, we had the 10 year review, which we talked about earlier. That's when you have to look at the plan every 10 years. Uh, this gives you the option, whenever these circumstances may arise, to also look at it. So, so the, this gives us the option annually, and it gives the whole, the entire decision to this board, not to the jurisdictions, but to this board to make that announcement. That's correct. Madam Chair? Well, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I, I do, Madam Chair, and I think that we, we have always, in, this, in the experience of our previous measures, shows that we've always followed the language contained in our own ordinance. Um, this is going to, as I mentioned earlier, to the uh, uh, California Department of uh, Tax and Fee Administration for their review. We can ask those questions of that agency at the time we go through this review. You're not going to be asked to formally adopt this uh, for several more months, and so we can have an answer to that before we come back for uh, formal consideration uh, of, the, uh, of the ordinance. But uh, again, uh, the proof is sort of in the pudding in terms of how this uh, authority uh, and the county have treated, uh, and I mean the county is a broader uh, g a group of uh, jurisdictions, uh, have treated uh, changes uh, go going forward, and it's on the, on the basis of the 10-year review. Okay, so I, I just want to, um, yeah, you know, in the, in the past Measure A, we have, um, we have had um, situations where we had projections that did, were not what we had anticipated, 
and um, people had borrowed against their future and because of our um, our projections not being as accurate as they could have been there were some jurisdictions that did not um, did not get what they thought they were going to get um, and so these kind of things uh, I, I think when we're going out uh, with a tax measure we should really think hard about what is it that um, and, and one of the people said it here today that what this is about is figuring out what will the taxpayers will the taxpayers be willing to help us and what will they be willing to help us with um, unfortunately it's going to be you know based on the polling which was amazing it's going to be difficult to to satisfy everyone but if we can if we can put together something that the taxpayers would be willing to do that would be um, a win for everyone because there would be more resources left over but when we have little things like this and then we go out with a name you know um, we name it and we market it in a certain way and it's not what people expected this is why we have a problem this is this is why we have a problem and um, I think it's really important that we maybe include um, you know the there was that conversation around the um, the um, taxpayer oversight that we include some of these uh, tax payer groups in our oversight uh, not just a politically appointed um, I talk but you know include some of those taxpayer oversight groups to to participate in that oversight to just maybe just have more eyes on it as oh. as we're moving forward because a lot of they wasn't you know it's like all of us missed it um, it, things uh, that happened in the past uh, were missed by b the board and the ITOC and the audits and uh, we didn't catch it until we realized it and that's how it happens sometimes so, okay does I, that cover it all yes it does okay. thank, thank you. you Carrie Howell um, just maybe this is a sign I've been here too long but I'm just gonna remind everybody that um, when we've made changes in the past uh, with the previous expenditure plans it was when we determined that the money that we expected to be there was not and I, I appreciate the fact that we wanna we wanna let the public know that this is the plan but it's an expenditure plan and um, to Al's point earlier there was some money that was moved around and it was moved around because a we didn't have the total amount of money that we expected to be there um, <coughs> starting with the recession and then moving forward with some accounting issues that I don't want to relive but at the time that that happened that would have been all well and good to leave all the percentages the same but if it meant that none of the projects that were on the list had sufficient funding to move forward then that didn't make a lot of sense. So there were times when money was shifted from one project to another because <coughs> one project was ready to go and if we moved forward with that out of sequence, then we would try to backfill for those projects that were either not yet ready to go or being delayed for some other reason. And I think that we're being short-sighted if we're not expecting that that very same thing will happen over a 40-year period. Either we will have more tax revenue than we thought we were going to have, or we will have less. But we're never going to have the exact amount of money that's being predicted right at this moment. So I think we need to give ourselves a little bit of room to adjust the expenditure plan and move monies from one project to another as, as we need to do that. So I think that's important, and I think that relates exactly to what um, uh, Board Member Frost was just referring to. Thank you. Mr. Hansen? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Carrie, I, I was at some of those board meetings, and I just I, I understand and agree with what you said, but I want to reframe it because I think it can be confusing. When we put an extent, ex expenditure plan out, I believe the current Measure A, and County Council can correct me, requires a two-thirds vote of this board to shift any of the expenditure targets for the course of those 30 years. To seize upon this provision within the 10 years, uh, the current measure A, if we went to amend it prior to now, I guess it was a two thirds vote of this board to be able to do that is my recollection. But what Carrie is talking about is that we didn't change the expected 30 year allocation for any project projects that weren't ready. We deprogrammed some of those monies and moved into projects that were ready, which is what smart, nimble organizations do if they need to 
to do that. But no project uh, that was promised funds over the 30-year measure were, were later said they weren't going to get those funds. That's not what we did. We just, we just moved mm. the money that was available for one so project. That, that still hasn't been paid, so no, but, over, but the 30 years, 2009 wasn't 30 years ago. We have 30 years to meet the expenditure plan carried out under the current Measure A. And so we haven't changed percentages in the current Measure A at all. We, they are still, That's right, yeah. but fun, projects that weren't ready that had money set aside for them, that money was shifted to projects that were ready. So I think it is a fallacy to say that we have not kept the promises there because not all those promises have ripened into fruition. No, I wasn't saying about anything about missing promises. What I was talking about is the fact that, um, you know, in some cases, there's probably a perception because the percentages changed because the anticipated total sales tax revenue did not exist. But, but the percentages in the expenditure plan didn't change what we were able to pay for Timing. at the time did change based on revenues, bonds, um, and which projects were ready. So some assets were moved around, but over the 30-year life of that measure, unless this board took a vote, and prior to 10 years, it would have been a two-thirds vote, so now we're past 10 years. I believe it's probably a different process now. Is that correct, Mr. Council? We have the 10-year review, which does not require two-thirds. Yes, So, but up till now, it was a two-thirds vote. We have not changed in the current measure, any percentage allocations. Those are still the promises that we made, and we have 2019-ish years to keep those promises. And, and I'm not entirely convinced that I agree with you that the percentages haven't changed. I suspect they have. It's just the fact. Of but the we, matter. but we, because we weren't typically looking at percentages. We were looking at but, dollar values of projects. But those weren't scheduled to be done by a certain date. So the fact of the matter is that we have not changed any percentages. We have moved money in current years to projects that were funded, and deprogram f money and put it into future years. That's all we did. We have not changed any percentages, period. Of course, I'm, all I'm saying is I'm not sure that's true, but I, I am not formally. <coughs> well, no, Bill, we haven't changed any percentages in the expenditure plan. No, we have yeah, not taken I'm agreeing a with you. Vote. That's, yeah. that's correct. Yeah. But we did fund some things earlier that were smart. Things that weren't ready had their monies moved to projects that were. That's all. That's normal. So we would do at any of our jurisdictions. Right, and I'm suggesting that we need to continue to do that. In fact, yeah, I agree to with take you. it one step further. I agree with you. I just want to make sure that when we make a promise, this is a very important thing that we keep it. And I think Ms. Frost is suggest suggesting that we may not keep it because I, of this I'm language. Not, no, I, what, I'm, what I'm asking is do we uh, have to operate under the Public Utilities Code? Because according to this code, we this board has it, – it's, it's almost um, – it's leading yeah. to, to write it all the way through the ordinance and, and through the expenditure plan that you're going to look at it every 10 years when every single year you have an opportunity to change it by this board and you don't even have to talk to the other jurisdictions. But, but could I, <laughs> since could I, I still have the floor, I, yeah, Madam Chair, can I respond to that? Yes, you can. I'm just trying to get I, to a point. I, I understand. I think we could I include. Was, I'm, I'm, I was asking uh, council that I have question. The, I, I have wasn't the floor. asking the board. I, I know, I but I have the council. floor now. Okay. I'm, I'm the person who has the floor. Yeah. So let me just, I believe that we could include into this expenditure ordinance the same provision that is in the current Measure A that in the first 10 years it would take a two-thirds vote, right? Uh, you, I don't think that there's a two-thirds requirement in the current measure, but you can do that for this measure. I can also say that the provision that you're referring to, it is optional with the board. I think what you're maybe getting towards is can we do that at the outset, basically say we're not going to exercise the option to look at this annually. And we're going to, whatever you approve in the expenditure plan, that's how it's going to be for the first 10 years. Maybe that's kind of what you had in I, mind. I think what I was going to say is can we just line out that end of that sentence? so that we leave out public utility, so that we're not writing into the expenditure plan and the ordinance something that we're, that is not our intention and not the way we're marketing it. I no right, I wouldn't put it that way. I wouldn't, uh, we can't line out the public utilities code. And I also do think you actually want that flexibility from that provision, but what I am saying legally, procedurally, if you wanted the new ordinance to include a provision that says, we are not going to exercise that option if, if we have unexpected additional revenues uh, or if there are unforeseen events 
we're not going to change anything. I'm not sure you want to do that, but um, you could. Well, I, I, I guess the reason um, that this is important to me is because 89% of, on, in the, the result of the polling, 89% felt, and this is region-wide, including all the jurisdictions, 89% felt that it was important that we have safeguards, that the money gets spent the way they thought, and that they, what's delivered is what they thought is, was going to be delivered. And so um, for the sake of transparency and um, just to make sure I understood it, because when I saw it, it was like a surprise. It's like a little bit of a surprise because uh, it wasn't at all what I thought. So I, that's, I, I was just comment. asking. And there's also two. It's something we need to have, include in the conversation. Okay, and there's also maybe two different issues here. There's, there's an issue hypothetically of what if we get all the revenue that we expect, that dollar figure that's in that paragraph I. We get it all um, over the first two, three, five years, whatever. Your concern is that provision in the code would allow this board under those circumstances to change up those allocations. The second issue is we don't get all that money, and that's what's happened in the first 10 years of current Measure A, and that's why we've had the reprioritizations of, of allocations. That's what's happened um, so far for you under the current measure. So, uh, could so, I, if I could suggest, I think maybe the subcommittee could chew this over and, and come back with a suggested language. Um, it, at least to, to hash it out and uh, come to a conclusion that the majority can um, support. Did you have anything else? Mr. Yeah, Hansen? I actually didn't. I didn't want to get into that depth. I just wanted to try to clarify some of that conversation. What I want to do is um, ask the staff as we work on these various expenditure plans. I was uh, troubled by Mr. Gatewood's comment about Rancho not getting a dollar in for a dollar back, but I think that doesn't capture regional projects that benefit the entire county and per capita. So I think with each of these expenditure plans that we've been shown, uh, to the extent that they're feasible or we will be debating them, that they show the value to the population of those jurisdictions each of those regional projects. That's number one, because I think that's a fallacy that we don't benefit from transit if we live in uh, Folsom or Rancher Cordova, or we don't benefit from air quality or the parkway, which are in separate buckets. But, but I do think we need to show that work so the public and the members of the board see how that will function. Uh, the second thing is um, I, I believe that we should fully vet the SAC Move Smart uh, expenditure plan and the policies there, I believe that we should incorporate into our ordinance a complete streets policy, an oversight committee that's more robust so that the public understands that we're not just going to continue to fix things in the broken way that they are to put them back in the broken way that they are. And, and there's no other way to do that than to put it in the ordinance. I, I tried very much in 2016 to get a complete streets policy into the uh, Measure B process. It didn't happen. I think that was one of the reasons people don't want streets without sidewalks. People don't want unsafe crosswalks or facilities that are dangerous. So if you if you need to get from point A to point B, your only way is to take a car. And I think we have an obligation as we fix things to fix them so that they're complete and whole streets. I also, um, I, I don't know exactly, Mr. Kempton, and this is my question for you. How is this board, because I'm not on that subcommittee, how is this board going to actually um, be able to work through these questions so thoroughly that the people in this room, who represent tens of thousands of other people, they're carrying concerns, and some of them don't agree. I get that the Alliance for Jobs doesn't like the transit folks, and you know the expenditure plans almost seem diametrically opposed that they put forward. I think that's unfortunate because I do think that there needs to be consensus, but I don't see that this process at this point through the subcommittee or through something else is gonna yield something that I can support or that my constituents will support. And my constituents sound a lot like this, the people in this room because they're concerned about the value of these investments, the intergenerational value of these investments and what they're gonna to do to help us make sure that our communities and our economy is sustainable. And so I, I just, I feel woeful that here we are at this crossroads with no clear map of how we're going to get to an end product that will 
help the, the people who see, you know, whether it's the connector getting half a billion dollars in the plan proposed by the Alliance for Jobs, or I hear from the people from SACMOVE and SMART <clears throat> that they, they think they, we need more transit and not more of these sprawl-inducing roads. So how are we gonna do that, Will? I, I just, I don't, I don't see a path. Um, Mr. Hansen, uh, I would have to say that the process that's been employed to date in, in the limited time that I've been associated with it, and that is having a steering committee uh, for the uh, staff and consultants to work with uh, on uh, issues that come up, uh, because we're reaching out to constituencies all the time. We'll continue to do that, and I think you're going to see in the next item uh, relative to the uh, to the schedule that we're proposing, we are serious about expanding the time for input and uh, giving us the opportunity to work with those constituencies. Uh, and I think the chair also has an idea about uh, potentially expanding uh, the, the, the steering committee uh, uh, that, uh, again, I think has worked well on issues uh, to, and the steering committee is obviously not taking any final action. They're simply hearing input that we provide and uh, indicating uh, uh, in their, their own input into the, that process, but any decisions come before the full board. Uh, in public session. So uh, that, uh, I, I think, again, uh, from my limited observation, that process has worked well so far. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to be ignoring or shutting off uh, the constituents uh, as we uh, go out and, and, and literally reach out to them to pr get their input as well, bringing that back to the steering committee so that they uh, have that information as they would make recommendations to the full board. Thank you, Will. I'll just, uh, this is my last thought. This measure is not to be a honeypot for special interests and people who want to um, feather their own nests. I think that we really have to take to heart the comments from our citizens who want to see this as a value to them and to the, the future. And so I appreciate the work you're doing, Will. But we have to maintain a high level of trust and integrity in this process if we're going to get two thirds. And this is the chance to really show people how we're going to do that. And I think you're leading on that process. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gatewood. All right. <clears throat> I'm sorry that you felt that, but my citizens aren't accepting of this proposal how it is at all. So uh, not that we don't understand and we don't want clean air, uh, nice transit and roads in, but you know, if we give $8.5 million and only $3 million comes back to us, it's not acceptable in Rancho Cordova. I could go out to go get my own tax revenue bill for my own citizens than where it's at. And the fact is we took a poll and we promised that we were going to follow to the poll. This, what citizens want is for us to fix the roads and fix the potholes. And I'm trying to, and right now, this doesn't represent what I see in Galt, what I see in Citrus Heights, what I'm seeing in Elk Grove, and what I'm seeing in Rancho Cordova. So I don't see this as ever, there's no way that something that's in the 30s is going to pass. And there's no way my citizens, which you know were 75 to 77,000, are gonna get behind this. They're gonna vote this down, no, and then once you lose us and you lose Citrus Heights, and if you lose Galt and most of Elk Grove on this, there's no way this is going through. So what we need to do is go through something that looks at least fair to us, to us, the cities that are going to be donating the money in, to where we feel like we're getting the same amount back out that we're putting in. And I get it. Uh, we want to do transit, uh, but 1%. What we really need to do is first fix what we have. We want to get our roads to something reasonable. Once we get there, we're willing to go and, and talk about the other things. We don't mind putting in 20, 30% into the overall nest to help out, but how are we not getting 78? How do I go to a citizen saying, hey, for every dollar you're going to kick in, you're going to lose, uh, you're only going to get 30% back? That doesn't make sense. I can't, I can't go with that, and neither can a lot of the other smaller cities. It doesn't work fairly on us. And so the other part is, is that why do we pay $170,000 to a group to go to a poll when we're not going to follow what the poll says? There's no way this is going to pass. Not a chance. Even if you all got behind this and pushed it, there's no way this is passing. So let's take the time to actually sit down and come up with something that we want to pass. I want to see this pass because we need, uh, for goodness sakes, our roads are all degrading right now. But if we're going to do this and actually expect it to pass, we have to listen to the citizens. I mean, I could go into all the, I mean, all the other stuff in the poll, because that's all I have to go off of is what our group went and polled that shows that 
the mass transit and other thing and thank you all the individuals that have come that it doesn't have the support of the individual groups so it doesn't have the port my my own group my own staff can't find a way for us to make this work so what i'm really looking for is one to get more voice into this and two to make it seem fair to us of the smaller groups that aren't you know represented i feel well in this this tax revenue because without rancho and without citrus heights and a couple of other cities there's no way this is passing there's no way something that has 30 percent on the polling is going to get 60 to 70 percent of the vote thank you mr miller uh, thanks um citrus heights is built out with no possible expansion outside our boundaries and we have a huge need to fix our roads, maintain our roads, and 70% of our polled voters said just that. Uh, we are in the process of creating complete streets and building pedestrian and bicycle trails. We don't need money for any additional lanes or roads. We were the first in the nation, possibly the world, to add citywide on-demand door-to-door transit service in Smart Ride, and it benefits our seniors and disabled. We were the first in Smuds territory to install a fast electric vehicle charging station. And as a reward for our efforts, we did not receive our Measure A allocations for fiscal year 1819. There was no recession. We had projects ready. So there's a trust issue with this, with this board. I believe that we paid the interest on money borrowed the year before for projects for other agencies. And so I want to know how we're going to be made whole under the current measure to start with. <clears throat> and what's to stop this organization from taking our future formula funds that are on, I, and I haven't looked at the newest expenditure plan, but on the last expenditure plan, we're woefully inadequate. So until these questions are answered, I just can't support another sales tax measure that taxes our citizens for projects and services that benefits others while we don't get enough money to take care of our own roads. Our arterials are being decimated by traffic with trips that neither originate or end in our city. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Cerna. Thank you. So uh, let me begin by um, uh, expressing my gratitude to the people that took um, all the time out of your busy schedules to be here and, and uh, testify. Twice. <laughs> well, I was going to say, selfishly, I, I uh, appreciate it because uh, I was unable to be uh, at the previous meeting for uh, personal reasons. And so, uh, again, selfishly, I had the opportunity to hear directly from you. Um, I want to start by saying that um, I agree with uh, most of what was uh, said, especially uh, with regards to kind of the thematic statement that we can't uh, continue to do the same thing over and expect different um, outcomes. As a member of both the Board of Supervisors, um, the RT Board, Local Air District, and the California Air Resources Board especially, um, I believe very strongly that uh, whatever form ultimately this measure may take, whether it's in the near future or years away because uh, we can't seem to um, make it work now, it has to be a bold plan. It has to, it cannot be timid. We have, there's too much at stake. What used to be decades ago, perhaps the simplicity of simply um, looking at our transportation needs is not that any longer. It is not just about transportation. It is about public health. It is about air quality. It is about criteria pollutants. It's about greenhouse gas emissions. And I, dis I disagree respectfully with the one speaker who said, I understand koalas are not your constituents. I would argue differently. I think they are our constituents because um, the decisions we make, whether it's in the, this context about transportation needs and resources, um, have a clear and direct connection to uh, climate change. And so as, um, as frustrated as some are on this board that we just heard from in terms of looking at um, uh, the allocation and whether or not, questioning whether or not it's equitable. I, I hear that and I respect it and I understand it. But I also want to make very clear, uh, speaking for myself, that I'm looking through the lens of public health as much as anything else. Uh, I agree, we have to fix what we have. Um, we have to have um, a fair allocation for our surface transportation uh, needs. Um, but I also uh, agree very strongly that we really need to push the envelope on a different day for transit. And um, we're not gonna get there if we continue to, um, to be scared of our shadow when it comes to doing that. And so that's what you can expect from, from this board member. 
uh, as we move through the, the process. Uh, that's where I'm, I'm at, and I've heard from uh, several today. I've heard from uh, others that have, uh, uh, I've had one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, about the need to be bold, and I appreciate those on this authority board that have already spoken today and before that uh, share that sentiment, uh, but I can't stress it enough. And so, um, again, let's not forget that this is a public health measure as much as anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sewell? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I also want to thank everybody for coming out today and, and hearing all your uh, voices. Um, it's not lost on any of us up here, regardless of whether folks agree with you or not. I, I, I truly believe that. Um, you know, as a commuter myself, I feel this personally. Uh, I, I need to drive from the far west or southwest of the region to, to the northeast. And um, so I, I feel it. I sit in that car. So I know what it means to, to, make, to have traffic relief uh, for me personally and everybody else who's on those roads with me. I also represent a community uh, down in Elk Grove where we don't have good transit right now. And because the freeways are maxed out, going forward as growth continues to occur, we don't have any options other than to have transit. So that is absolutely a vital uh, uh, vital uh, piece of infrastructure for our community and for the future, not to mention all the greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions and environmental uh, concerns that were already raised. But as I, so, so I give you both perspectives um, because um, this measure is gonna be a true test of this region's ability to collaborate. And, is, and it's gonna be a, a question of all my my friends and colleagues up uh, on this dais, uh, how bad do we want to be right versus how bad do we want to actually move the needle? Because regardless of whether we agree up here, and this is the, only the first hurdle, then we got to go out to the voters, as, as what some people articulated already. And many of those voters don't take transit. I think everybody <laughs> here knows that. Many of those voters feel the, the traffic, and they're sitting in there just like uh, I am, and they're going to vote with their hearts in that in that regard. So be bold, yes, but will you resonate with that person that's sitting in traffic who wants his or her uh, conge freeway congestion relieved? Uh, I, I doubt that myself. So again, I, I you know, I I'm hearing the the different sides up here, but I, I need to impress upon my my colleagues. We need to get it together right here on the dais first to speak as one voice and to do that we can't all be right, and we won't all be happy. We're not gonna get everything that we want. But I tell you, when you look at that plan and we speak to the voters, I, I do see, you know, from a starting point, what's presented before us today is not something that, you, you know, we, we should, uh, that needs to be thrown out, per se. I mean, there's, while, while not entirely equitable, while not, enough transit or enough uh, roads, I, I guarantee you there's good things in there for every every party. There's relief on the freeways, there's taking care of our roads, there's taking care of the current system. You heard RT themselves come up and, 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 and talk uh, positively. So there is something in there for everybody today. I think it's a, it's a, it's a starting point and I look forward uh, to working with my colleagues to finding consensus so that we can move forward and, and then start to communicate with uh, voters uh, of this region. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Natoli. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'll, I'll be brief. I just would, would you know, echo what's been said relative to thanking all those who weighed in, <clears throat> certainly today, but also uh, over the course of the last 30 days. I think one thing that we can readily agree on is that um, our transportation network is 30 days more aged than it was when we were in these chambers a month ago, and that the needs will continue to uh, be there whether we uh, figure out a measure to go before the voters or not. And I think that we have an opportunity to be both pragmatic but also visionary, and those things aren't in direct conflict. And I, certainly the, the job that Mr. Kempton and others are going to be tasked with over the next few weeks as we uh, continue to seek information and you know then obviously come back into these chambers and, and, and deliberate uh, what we might put before the voters uh, you know, and what's going to be included and what won't be included as a part of that. I want to say that that I think, uh, again, as much as we've started since the uh, the defeat of the last measure, uh, to try to be timely and to you know give ourselves time to put together 
uh, you know, a plan that, you know, reflects obviously a, a variety of elements that we hopefully can get behind. Uh, time is not our friend again. Uh, we're right kind of back where we hoped we wouldn't be. And I think to comments that are made here today that <clears throat> it's gonna be very important for those that, uh, all of us who represent significant voting constituencies to uh, figure out certainly as best we can, both here on this dais, but also then respectively, because this has to go back to our respective bodies uh, for concurrence and, and, and support and uh, you know, the work that we're about to do here over the next, uh, you know, several weeks, probably a couple of months, uh, you know, is gonna have a tremendous amount of bearing on what our colleagues and certainly our constituencies, if we do agree on a measure, are going to uh, have before them and in, in, in support or not uh, come November, if that's where we, we get to. So again, I think uh, today's indicative, obviously, of I think some of the stresses and, and, and strains that go into trying to craft something that we believe, one, we can get behind, but secondly, that we believe reflects obviously uh, components that are uh, a part of comments today, but certainly a part of what we know has been identified in the polling, as well as again, what we know from our respective uh, uh, deliberations in our chambers um, on, a, on a regular basis relative to infrastructure and investments in that. And so um, I, I think that it's been said many times, but obviously, uh, if we don't find, you know, find that, you know, using my words, sweet spot, and be able to, you know, convey that to voters and reflect that, then we're going to be talking about a whole lot of nothing. And uh, I think we recognize that, you know, the infrastructure ages, and uh, so we're going to try to get this as right as we can. And but I think and certainly be respectful of the various constituencies and certainly the voices here. So a lot of work ahead. We'll certainly, you know, you got your hands full. And it's not all on your shoulders, but and certainly compliments to. Those that are here today that have weighed in, we've got a lot to think about and a lot to work on over the next several weeks. Thanks. Thank you. Patrick Hume. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, uh, I'll try and be more concise and less impassioned than I was at the last meeting. Um, but I do appreciate everyone that came back out and had the opportunity to uh, uh, make comment today. Um, I want to echo kind of the end of what um, Director Natoli was just speaking about there. I, I was talking to one of our constituents last night and he made a comment uh, that was put much more eloquently to sum up essentially what I was driving at the last time we met, and that is that, that the wolves, quote unquote, are arguing over the carcass while the animal is still on the hoof. <laughs> and if you think about that, what that means is until or unless this plan gets passed, we have 100% of nothing to discuss where it goes. And um, so that was the point that I was trying to make, and I appreciate Director Cerna's point about this being a health issue, but stress, is a major factor in, in people's health. And the stress of sitting in traffic, as, as Director Suen mentioned, is, is, a, is a real concern. And I think if we wanna talk about being bold or not using old thinking, an easy trap of old thinking is conflating congestion with emissions. I think if you look at the disruption that's happening within the transportation industry, it is toward the type of fuel that propels our vehicles, it's toward automation of those vehicles, and it's toward rideshare and not, not having traditional ownership of vehicles. It is not in uh, reducing the need for capacity and throughput. And so to continue to demonize um, roadway capacity, I think isn't gonna serve us well because our own poll numbers tell us that's what's important to the voters. And so, uh, I don't know how we got to this point now, and I don't want to delve too far into the weeds on the process. But, you know, in 2016, we came awfully close, within, I think, 1% of hitting that magical two-thirds number. And, if that, if, and, and we said that the variable of why we didn't hit that number was because we got started too late and we didn't have enough time of, for a robust education and outreach program. So rather than test that one variable, and go back out to the voters with a more robust, uh, more crafted uh, education and outreach program and the same plan, we've now upended that plan and have something completely different that, that, we're, that we're, we're back in the same place here again, um, arguing over a carcass that doesn't yet exist. And so, um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that I, I just, it, if we want to keep having this us versus them scarcity mindset, that I have to demonize the opposition in order to get what I think, quote unquote, my constituency wants. Um, we're gonna drive this thing right to where either we don't ever get it on the ballot and or if it gets to the ballot, the voters are gonna tell us you asked me and you didn't listen. 
And so I, I think that if we get to that point, we have done everyone in this room and all future generations a tremendous disservice. And so I would just implore that as we dive into this plan, to the extent that we don't just play around the edges, that we really get in and look at what is a plan that makes sense for all of these communities within this region, uh, and just be honest about it. So that's all I have to say today. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Harris? Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, I've said before that this plan cannot be everything to all people, and I think you've heard that reflected a lot in the comments today. Uh, I agree with uh, Mr. Soon and Mr. Hume. I agree with Supervisor Cerna, and I agree with Garrett Gatewood as well. This will never satisfy everybody completely. I would say this, having sat on the committee to bring forward the draft expenditure plan over the last year, that we did actually make a pretty good attempt to try to reflect the will of the voters via the polling as best we could. Everything in this transportation expenditure plan is a compromise. Um, the, there is one piece that is frustrating for me, which is that it's been crafted more on desire. Thank you, Jeffrey. Sorry, it's supposed to be on. Um, Can you turn it up? Uh, this plan is crafted more on desire than on data, and I think that uh, the idea of bringing in SACOG and, and some data from the MTP is going to be very valuable. I also would like to see a little bit more policy crafted into this measure as well. So I appreciate what SAC Moves has done. They've put in a tremendous amount of work. You know, I, we hear about being bold with this expenditure plan. I agree. I would love to lower vehicle miles traveled, then we certainly need to reduce greenhouse gases. But we can't affect that all through a, through a tax measure. It's not going to happen with this one measure. We should certainly work in that direction, but as has been <clears throat> stated several times, if we don't pass a measure, we've got a whole lot of nothing to talk about. The status quo is not going in a way that we would like it to go. Um, so I look forward to that data. I think it's going to be very uh, important moving forward. The other thing I'd like to say is uh, some of the testimony today seemed to be predicated on the assumption that if you build new roads, you will increase VMT. And I would challenge that assumption. I'm not certain that it's correct given the congestion problems that we have currently. Sometimes building new roads can relieve a lot of greenhouse gas emissions because transportation flows more, more efficiently and frequently. So um, you, you have to be sort of um, creative in the way you think about it. None of these ideas are absolute, except one, that if we don't pass this measure, we're, we're really going to be behind the eight ball in terms of our transportation possibilities moving forward. So that being said, I look forward to more work on the committee and here at this dais to see if we can get a little bit more buy-in. But, but I'd like to leave it with this, that I think that the TEP that we've presented at this point is not the same as Measure B. And uh, we are looking at it from, through a different lens and more creatively. And I think it's moving in the direction that actually satisfies more people. And uh, to that extent, if we only missed by 1% last time, perhaps we do have a shot. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Howell? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, again, I'd, I'd like to thank as many of the other board members have today, all the folks that came out that were unable to speak at the last meeting that came back down here today that share your thoughts with us. Um, just, again, this is comment coming from the geek, but there's been a lot of comments today about discussion of complete streets and suggesting that policy, transportation engineering and civil engineering policy should be the purview of STI. I just want to remind everybody that the, it is this board oversees money that is generated from sales tax and doles it out to the projects that end up on the approved expenditure list. All of those projects come from the individual jurisdictions. They come from City of Folsom Public Works Department, Rancho, Elk Grove, Sac County, all of the member agencies here. The, the projects and all of the plans and the discussions about greenhouse gas reduction, vehicle, miles traveled, all of that mm. is included in the project plans, whether or not there's sidewalks in the plan. All of that information is done by engineers that work for the various jurisdictions. The, um, all of those professionals came together and kind of duked it out, if you will. I did not attend those meetings, but the, um, it's called the PAG. It's the professional, all of the professional folks. And that's how the, the draft got 
to be what's in the draft plan. So to those of you that are worried about very specific things, about complete streets, all of that, the place to bring those conversations up is at Folsom City Council meeting, Rancho, Elk Grove, Board of Supervisors, <coughs> not in this group. Our, the objective of this board is to move forward, yes or no, with the sales tax plan, and then to oversee the projects that are included in the ultimate plan, and we dole out money. We don't design them, we don't build them, we don't do any of that. Um, having said that, again, I do think this is a different plan from what it was in 2016. I'm glad that everybody um, feels so passionate about this. As I said when I was sitting in Susan's chair three years ago, if we come up with a plan that no one is entirely happy with, we've probably done a really good job. So I hope that we can get relatively soon to a point where we can agree on what does and does not need to be included in the plan, and that all of us that feel passionately about it will talk to our neighbors at the post office, the grocery store, wherever, you know, sitting on the light rail train, wherever it might be, and convince them that not everybody's gonna get everything that they want, but it's better for us as a region to move forward and know that we can make the improvements that we need to keep the region economically viable. Thank you, Mr. Gatewood. You know, <clears throat> I would love to see if, if we're talking about, I'd love to, you know, actually try to split this into two things. One being bold and one being boring. You know what's boring? Roads and fixing potholes. And then put another, and then have another half cent on this very creative bill to go get the roads and the, and the mass transit and all the stuff that we really want. So I know that, I don't know how viable that is, but it would love to be able to split this into something that I know, like that has the highest percentage of passing, and then something that's more creative that we could go get. Because a lot of this is running into is, I want to pass something to protect my citizens and protect the roadways and the thoroughfares so the Ubers and the electric cars and all that stuff can actually can work in the next 20 years. At the same time, I also think that mass transit. So, you know, as we're going down this step, there's no reason why we have to always be just one, one and done. I would love to see something along those lines because why not step out and be like, look, half cent for this, half cent for that. Let the voters decide. Because right now, if you put something on there that's boring and says, yeah, we're just going to try to keep your roads fixed. And then the other ones, look, this one's including roads and transit. And let the, let the citizens really make the decision. Okay, Ms. Frost? I'd just like to um, make a final comment relating to the polling. The, uh, I was really excited when I saw the polling because it, um, it gave me some confirmation that I understood my constituents and it also, um, I could see a path to where we could possibly fulfill uh, the desires of not only the citizens but the businesses and and um, housing and everything we need in our region, which is more money uh, for roads. And the overall takeaways from that polling, including every jurisdiction, including the huge city of Sacramento and the county, was that 74% wanted to fix roads and relieve congestion. 73% wanted to get their fair share for transportation funds. 89% wanted funds to be used as promised with strong safeguards. 73 wanted safe routes to school for children. 71% wanted senior disabled transit services. And 69% wanted potholes fixed. And that was including the city of Sacramento on an informed polling of um, uh, 1,636 people, which is a huge poll. It was um, a, a very low margin of error. And so I kind of feel like the, you know, I feel, uh, I feel like all of these, um, all of you who are advocating for in all these different areas, I know you need the money and I know we have to figure out how to get more money to you. Um, but, you know, like uh, Director Hume said, it, uh, something it might be better than nothing. And if we don't pass a measure, if, if I think what the people are saying, they've, they basically told us what they want. If we give them what they want, we might have a chance of actually being able to go out and all of us support it and feel good about it and they'll vote for it and we'll have you know over eight billion i think it was over 40 years coming in and so why not 
um, you know, and when when that happens, there will be more a little some relief in in all the jurisdictions because there will be money for things that we have to do. The roads are not going to go away. Uh, we can try and get people out of their cars, but we still have to maintain the roads. And the further they go, um, degrade, the the more expensive they are to fix. And so, um, why not? go for something that's a sure win, path to a win, and that will help everyone. Um, I think we need to rethink the expenditure plan. I'm not talking about the details or the projects. I know there's, and I know there's some really important things that RT is doing. We need to figure out how to get money to uh, all of everyone. But um, I think if this is about putting together something that the taxpayers will vote yes and um, be willing to help us with. And so uh, I think that's what I, I'm hopeful that we can um, come together on. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, I, I think uh, this is a good time to discuss the, have the subcommittee discussion. I, uh, particularly given the differences uh, and early thoughts of board members, I, we need to add, I think we need to add uh, two more cities to the subcommittee, and I would suggest Rancho Cordova and Citrus Heights. So, Mr. Gatewood and Mr. Miller. I, I would concur, thank you. Okay. I'd like to be on it, thank you. Okay, great, thank you. We'll, we'll get you a schedule. Pardon? That would make three, and so uh, that would be a Brown Act problem. So. Ignore my request, I think. Oh, thank you. Okay, so Mr. Kennedy and I are already on it, and then uh, Mr. Suen is from Elk Grove, and Mr. Harris and Mr. Chenier from the City of Sacramento. So, uh, and Ms. Howell, yes, and, how could I forget you? And I think it'll be <clears throat> Councilwoman uh, Middleton. Um, we're going through appointments right now, so I don't know till tonight who, who will be our okay. representative. All right. But it'll uh, be one of us. So <laughs> if. Uh, we would take note of those additions to the subcommittee. Um, it's uh, time now to, uh, we're gonna vote on, no, we, we are not voting. We, we're, uh, it does say approval here of the tentative uh, measure a uh, sales tax timeline and meeting schedule. So uh, I, I think it's uh, evident again here today that we need these extra meetings, so I'm, I'm glad. Mr. Kempton was able to come up with some dates and, and get this room for those uh, meetings and um, or I believe we have to vote on this. Yes. So does anybody? Okay. Anyone have a question? Okay, please vote. Okay. Unanimous so vote. Take this sheet home with you and add it to your calendar. Uh, then we're going to item six. Read that in. Item number six, contract with Townsend Cal Calkin, Tapio Public Affairs for Public Education and Outreach. Second. Uh, any discussion? Does anyone have any questions about it? Okay, please vote. And the motion passes with uh, member Hume recusing. Or abstaining, excuse me. Okay. Um, next item, please. Next item is item number seven, selection of chair and vice chair for calendar year 2020. Uh, if I could, as chair, suggest that we uh, elevate Mr. Suen to chair since he's been vice chair this year. I'm so happy good. to hand over the bucking bronco uh, to Mr. Elevate. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Levitating. I'll second. Throw. Okay. <clears throat> please vote. And then would suggest that Mr. Natoli become vice chair as we have a county seat that comes up um, as vice chair. Okay, please vote. Clear the screen, please. please that vote. was a unanimous vote on the first vote. And uh, screen's not working. Okay, there we go. Okay. <laughs> And Zianna's vote for Supervisor Natoli as vice chair. Okay, congratulations to both of you. <laughs> you want to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, Going out with the bank? 
So <laughs> I'm assuming given the hour that there are no further comments from authority members. Okay. Meetings adjourned. Good job, Susan. Thank you for your oh my goodness. <laughs>